welcome everybody. Um, we are we do have a couple of other people arriving um, that we know of, but we'll nevertheless get started. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you to this meeting of council. The meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and the voices and images of those participating in the meeting and in the gallery may be captured as part of this recording. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, pay respects to our elders, to their elders past and present, and welcome any descendants who may be here this evening. As councillors, we have all taken an oath to carry out our duties in the best interests of the people of Indigo Shire and to do this in a fair and impartial manner. We are all committed to exercising the council's powers and functions to the best of our skills and judgment. Do I have any apologies or leave of absence? Nope. Any declarations of conflict of interest? Nope. So um, we are tonight... Uh, with our open forum, we want to recognise and congratulate uh, two of, uh, of our uh, residents who were awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia, but they're not here quite yet. So we might start with uh, the questions from open forum and then we'll, we will um, finish with that a bit later on. So um, first question is from Ian Welsh. Welcome, Ian. Sorry, Ian, we'll just put that on so people can hear you who are watching. Thank yeah, thanks. Uh, late last year, uh, the council declared a climate emergency and now your intention is to uh, create some sort of action regarding that climate emergency. Uh, part, of the, part of the action, as I understand it, is that um, you've engaged... Uh, a firm of public relations uh, to seek feedback. Um, the first question is, well, what what actually are you intending to uh, to uh, what action are you intending to take regarding the the, uh, uh, the climate emergency and how how's the uh, when 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 you say you. You, you, you're asking for feedback. How's that going to work? Yeah. And can anybody um, uh, become involved in that feedback? Yes, so um, just to be clear, that uh, we've employed um, two people, actually, to, to undertake this work. Uh, one is Fishbowl Public Relations and another is a consultant who, who specialises in this. So... Um, in this area of climate change. Uh, and so the, the part of what's going to happen now is that they're going to come to us with a brief of how they're going to uh, engage with the community and seek input from people who have expertise in this area that live in our shire um, and from surrounding uh, other areas that are already working in this, in this space right across Australia and the world even, um, and also about input from the community who may be interested for various reasons. So we, we haven't seen that brief yet. We've just employed these people. They'll come to us with a, a brief and then we'll be able to put out that information to the community uh, and, and, and be able to tell you how to be engaged and how this is going to be played out. So do I understand uh, the first procedure is, is you're going to seek uh, advice as to how to go about seeking advice? Well, we've employed people who will now undertake that process so they'll come back to us with the uh, the structure that they've got in place to do that. Yeah. So that's their job now is to tell us how they'll go about doing that work. It's going to be a fairly involved procedure. In yep, the it will be. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that answers your question, Ian. Uh, sort Thank of. you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, we'll I give you more to, information as soon as we have that. I just wanted to be sure uh, that we'll have the opportunity uh, to to put um, you know yes uh, information we, we, into you. We definitely want to hear from the community okay. on this, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is from uh, Sandra, Sandra Williams. Hi, Sandra. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have some questions about the um, current problem, the bushfires. Um, following the devastating 
February 2009 bushfires near Beechworth. The council CEO at the time welcomed the federal government's grant of nearly 3.5 million to upgrade, upgrade several nominated prospective emergency staging and relief centres in the Shire. And that was reported in the Border Mail um, on the 22nd of May 2009. Um, Barmutha Park Beechworth was nominated and subsequently allocated $900,000 in order to make it fit for purpose in case of future emergencies, serving much the same function as the Wangaratta Performing Arts Centre did this summer, I understand. Uh, this year, though, we're told that there are only two places in Beechworth, the Memorial Hall and the Police Paddocks, which are nominated as neighbourhood safer places, places of last resort. These in the council literature, um, quote, do not guarantee the survival of those who assemble there, end of quote. Um, so some questions. What happened to the planned and funded upgrading of Barmuth Park Sporting Complex to serve as a relatively safe, well-equipped emergency relief centre and the $900,000 allocated for this purpose? So I'll actually ask Mark Florence to answer that in terms of the spend of the $900,000. Oh, sorry, Trevor can, yeah. But before I do that, I think it's really important to clarify here that there is a big difference between a relief centre and a place of last resort. Um, we have raised the issue that they should not be called safer places because they're not. Exactly. Uh, the relief centre, yeah, we've raised that with the CFA and asked them to, that this is a statewide issue actually, asked them to raise that. So um, it's important to understand that when a relief centre is set up, it's actually somewhere for people to go to uh, when they've evacuated and currently they're not within the Shire. Um, they were in Wangaratta and Wodonga in the current, uh, in the current fires. Uh, the places of last resort are places people uh, can flee to if their bushfire plan has failed and they are unable to evacuate and leave. They are not safe and they are not meant yes. to be safe. There is no message there. So, so the idea that Barmutha Park is a, a safe haven is incorrect. A relief centre is set up mm. when the emergency services asks council to open a, um, a facility in a place that is safe. That is very different. So I think there's confusion around that, understandably. I think a lot of the messaging is confusing around what happens. So that money, uh, I'll get Trevor to answer that, but that would not in any way be designed to set up a place that would protect people in the, in the case of fire. Well, my question then is, why was it deemed to be so in 2009 and reported as such so and received as such? Centre. Relief Centre. Yeah. So a Relief Centre is when the emergency services determine that a place is safe, they will say, they will ask council to open it as a relief centre. In this case, in these fires, the CFA and the SCS determined that there was nowhere safe in Indigo Shire to open a relief centre. All of those places were at risk. We are only following their advice, Sandra. Right. It's not our decision. Yeah. So that begs the question, um, what happened to that $900,000 that so was fit for purpose, given for, to fit it for that purpose? Yes. So would you like to answer that, Trevor? So... Um I think we've got to keep in mind that relief centres can apply to more than just fires. So the relief centres can be in place for storms and for floods and a whole range of events. So you know, I would presume by move the park would be certainly adequate to provide a, a relief centre service. Um, so depending on the emergency, the incident control centre will determine where a relief centre is, is held and it will depend on circumstances of that particular event. So you, you, you do have some other questions here where you note other buildings and facilities that also uh, were funded as relief centres and, and exactly the same thing that they all can function as relief centres uh, in different circumstances. So there was an example recently where there was a flood on the on the freeway and a relief centre was opened up at Chilton. So it was a specific uh, event and a specific relief centre was opened. So they can all serve a relief centre purpose at the time. Uh, some of these questions are relate to fires and are they relief centres? No, they're not relief centres. Um, unless the incident control centre says that they are, in which case we would swing into action and set them all up as relief centres. But the, the harsh reality of, 
of Beechworth is that if there's a fire, there's nowhere safe in Beechworth. You just get out and you just follow the evacuation orders that people uh, ask us to do at the right time. So there's no place you would want to go to Beechworth um, if, the, if the advice is get out, and that's what you do. There's nowhere safe in Beechworth to be in a fire. This is a harsh reality of it. Mm. So as uh, the Mayor mentioned, there's a couple of places that designate as a place of last resort, and that's yes. where fires come in, your, your plan failed. Uh, these places aren't places to go to for refuge or relief. They're just, um, if all else has failed, there's somewhere to go that might be better than where you are or might not. Uh, and we've seen um, photos of places at Kudjiwa, for example, which were um, places of last resort, which also burned completely. Um, so they aren't they aren't a guarantee for anything. So we've got to get used to the terminology. Relief centres are not refuges from a fire. They're just somewhere you go after you've been evacuated and there'll be facilities there, there'll be food and beds and um, agencies there to help you out with your various needs, but they're not there to save you from a fire. I think we need to be clear on that. So there are no safe places in Beechworth that would guarantee your survival? That's right. There's nowhere safe. Mm -hmm. And that's been deemed by the CFA and uh, the emergency services because of our where we are on the top of a ridge surrounded by bush. There may be buildings that are safer than yours, but um, the advice from the emergency service is unequivocal, which mm. is you are to evacuate when you're told to. And there is nothing that we can say that will make that message any different to that um, because we are obliged to give that message and we realise it's a very distressing message for people to get. It, doesn't, it, it creates a lot of issues for people. Nevertheless, if they tell us there's nowhere safe, we can't possibly say to you, well, maybe this place is safe. They're not. And we have to take that advice. Mm. And we have to give that advice to the community. And yes. Sandra, we've spent the whole summer dealing with people who, of course, as we are, are upset by that, feel uncertain, are anxious. That is the nature of the situation we're in now. It's yes. very distressing and upsetting. I, I, I just understand that. I'm just thinking I went and had a look at the um, Barmutha um, function hall the other day and the lower part of it is clad in what looks like plywood. And I'm yeah, just wondering so at the safe. point that it right. was built yeah. with, you know, close to a million dollars allotted for that purpose to protect us, yes. so um, I, what's happened there? Yeah, I think the, the money has been spent on all the facilities and things, but they do not raise those levels, those buildings to a level where they are safe refuges in fires. There are, there are none. Okay, so I hope... It's not a great answer. It's not an answer any of us are happy with, but it's what we're facing. No, I'm not happy. Um, and am I to understand that the CFA was the authority that nominated the, that term, safer places? I don't know if it was the state government or the CFA, but we've certainly fed back to the CFA that it's, it's uh, confusing, it's misleading, um, and to say there's a safer place when, in fact, at the same time they're saying there is nowhere safe means that, in fact, it confuses people and we've asked them to correct mm. it. Yes, it's it's not something we name. We don't we don't yeah. allocate that name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Sandra. Okay. Um, next one is uh, Robin McLeish. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good to see you all back, ready for a year of focused. Action. My first question tonight refers to Tourism North East. And councillors would be aware that Shepparton City Council, together with Mitchell, Murrindindi and Strathbogie Shire Councils, have moved to discontinue their relationship with Goulburn River Valley Tourism and return tourism management to within the council. Ballarat City Council has also moved to discontinue their relationship with Visit Ballarat and return tourism management to the council. Will count, my first question, will council establish a formal submission process to allow residents to express their views on the proposed renewal of the memorandum of understanding between the council and Tourism North East before June 30, when the current MOU expires? So, uh, thanks for that question through you, Madam Mayor. Um, regional tourism boards were created, I'll say some eight, nine years ago now. 2009. As a 
nine, so what does that make it? 11 years ago now, uh, which um, basically created structures by which councils had to be part of a regional tourism board, a local regional tourism board, in which to continue to receive funds from the state uh, to spend on tourism and destination marketing and things like that. So they changed the structures so that no state money would be directed directly to a council, uh, but only go through a regional tourism board. That was that was the history of it. And so council's been part of a, a regional tourism board which uses the name Tourism North East. Um, <clears throat> it's fair to say that um, there's been varying degrees of success and failure of regional tourism boards across the state. And there is currently a state review being done of the regional tourism boards. Um, however, it's it's fair to say that Tourism North East has been singled out time and time again, uh, even through these reviews, and this review will actually say that, as, as a shiny example of a regional tourism board that is actually highly successful. So we are lucky enough, uh, us, five other councils and three uh, resort management boards are actually lucky enough to be part of the, the highest functioning regional tourism board being Tourism North East. And that's been um, widely quoted across the state. It's true there are some councils who have dropped out of the regional tourism board because those particular boards haven't functioned well and they've seen to do that. We don't see a need to do that. Um, we, we won't be establishing a formal submission process, and I say that categorically because that MOU has already been signed, so that, that has ex extended our role, uh, our partnership with Tourism North East for another three years, I believe it is, from, from the 1st of July 2020. So that, that process has come and gone. Um, our association with Tourism, Tourism North East is very strong and very successful, and we continue to grow in our visitor numbers and visitor spend in the region as a result. So your answer is no. That was a question. Are we going to be permitted to yes. the answer participate is the MOU's in your saying no? The MOU has already been signed. No. And you've already done it with no notice whatsoever. So your next question. Fine. I've yeah. just got a question oh, sorry. for Tasia. How much do we pay to become a member of, T of TNA? Cash. So TNA has a couple of components. I'm going from memory here. Uh, there's, a, there's a core component which covers the basic operating costs of T&E. Uh, we, I think it's in the vicinity of thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. Forty-three thousand, I think you're there after. You go. You're not better than me. Uh, to be a, a part of them on a permanent basis, but we also then participate in various programs uh, that are established throughout the year in collaboration with other councils. And again, we do find that uh, through through leveraging off our work with T&E and through other councils, we get far better. Um, bang for our buck than we would ever would travelling alone uh, in, in terms of trying to attract people to the region. Okay, thank you. Your next question, Robin. Question two, back to the Plate Layers Cottage. Did Council submit a grant application for the work required on the Plate Layers Cottage, which they own and have allowed to deteriorate and become unsuitable for occupation due to their lack of management and maintenance? Um, so, yeah, you can answer one, Trevor. Sorry, I'll, I'll hand that over to Trevor. Um, council hasn't, in, in recent times, hasn't submitted a grant application uh, itself. Uh, we're certainly on the lookout for grant opportunities for the Plate Layers Cottage, as you know. There was an agenda item on this very topic a, a while back, which um, um, it's, it's actually a sort of complicated resolution to work through, but basically uh, the implications of that resolution was that staff needed to go away and do some more work to work to find more grant opportunities uh, and also work with community groups to find ways to um, spend money on uh, keeping this plate layers cottage um, and st stopping it deteriorating further uh, without necessarily allocating directly money directly itself. They were pursuing other opportunities then, again, working through various groups and uh, grant opportunities. There was uh, an application for um, through the Lions Club um, who put an application into a recent um, community grant funding scheme that the local MP uh, administered on behalf of the federal government. And the Lions Club were successful in securing $20,000 for uh, to spend on the Plate Layers Cottage. It will, um, leveraging off that, leveraging off some support from, some in-kind support from council, not cash, and also leveraging off other groups and uh, places like the Correctional Centre who who will help out with some labour. Um, there's a hope that we can put together a package that will um, spend some money on that cottage and to uh, improve its condition 
and um, delayed its deterioration or improved that from, from the exterior. Uh, it's a start. It's not the complete solution, and nor will it... Um, uh, it won't get it to a stage at this point where it's uh, suitable for occupation, but it's certainly a step forward, and we'll keep working away with community groups and other, look for other grant opportunities to, to spend on that, on that cottage and to try and bring it back to where it should be. Third question, when the Lions Club completes the work they're planning to carry out on the building, will it become suitable for occupation and what will it be used for? As the building owner, will the council determine this before they allow a third party to work on a building that belongs to the community? So, um, the build, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, you go. Yes, you, you go. Oh, I was just going to say, I think um, we answered that question in terms of it won't be ready for occupation, but the work is then to be trying to access more funding, given that the decision of council was not to directly fund it. Um, to try and seek more funding to do that. But the um, certainly the conversations I've had with the Lions Club people that are already working on this is that, that they see it as a facility for the community and that the community will be the ones that will access it and use it. But as to who exactly that isn't, we can't do that until we get the thing actually up to uh, capacity for or to be ready to be used. But that's certainly the plan for the future. There's Thank a big you. gap between the... Um 180,000 that was initially suggested, which was bid up to almost 400,000 when the council officers made their guesstimates. So it's a long way from being Thanks, anything we're, productive. We're working on how to get that. Well, get I hope it you work state. very determinedly. We are. We are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have two more questions and then we'll be um, award. Uh, um, Sorry, congratulating our award winners. So the next one is from Jeff Palmer. Oh, are you right, Jeff? It's a bit squashed in there. Seat can't go yours there. Welcome, Jeff. Madam Mayor, good evening, councillors. Um, Bush. Bushfires are, uh, are a, a, a topical topic. Um, and uh, I think that Beechworth has been very lucky uh, this uh, summer in uh, escaping uh, the worst of it. Um, I use the word lucky um, with purpose. It should be uh, f uh, w with good fortune and good planning. I think it has been a matter of luck. And so my questions uh, uh, revolve around uh, just what has been done uh, or what has been done uh, leading up to this fire season by council on its own property to protect um, uh, the town's people and, uh, and uh, council assets. So and so my question uh, is uh, what action has council taken in the period leading up to and immediately prior to the current fire season and what further action might be proposed to ensure the primacy of people's safety and well-being during the current fire season? And in your response, uh, will you give particular and specific information relating to the management of roadsides and fuel reduction, logs and dead vegetation, controlled burns on council-managed land, both undertaken and advocated for. And I might just point out there that um, in the roadside management plan, uh, there are quite detailed uh, statements about how long the grass has uh, got to be on roadsides and what have you. But how effective is the strategy if we don't implement it? And my, uh, I'm standing here saying to you, that I don't think we are implementing it. I'd also be interested in the advocacy for fuel reduction and the review of the roadside management policy, recognising that the existing policy may not be adequate. And I'd also be interested to, uh, to uh, see the last three meetings of the Emergency Management Committee. I'm not quite sure what they do and what uh, recommendations or actions uh, they actually take that uh, are effective. As I say, I think we've been lucky. I wish I could use the word fortunate. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Jeff. Um, just in terms of the last three meetings, I assume you mean minutes of the Emergency Management Committee, so we can't hand those over in this meeting yeah, tonight. Yeah, minutes, I'm sorry. Yeah, and we can't read out minutes of three meetings in, in, in the public forum tonight, so I'll find out how you can get access to that. But, Ian, would you like to respond to the rest of Jeff's question? Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, look, I'll do my best to cover off on the, on the point you've asked. Council's uh, work in the lead up to a fire season is done collaboratively with other agencies, so typically, you know, CFA and the like, generally through our Emergency Management Planning Committee, which you've referred to. So, look, I've, I've documented a few things here which I'll read out in no particular order, but through the, emerg or the Municipal Emergency Management Planning Committee, we've conducted a review of Council's fire management plan. So we have a fire management plan, um, which is a sub-plan of our Municipal Emergency Management Plan. Um, that includes, or, or, or that review has included the confirmation of a list of roads that are important in fire management planning. So there's, um, I think, 140 odd roads on that list, and they've been determined as the strategically important roads in fire, both for firefighting, but also for ingress and egress of, of community trying to escape fire. Uh, we've then worked with CFA and given them approval to conduct. Uh, works on those roads, sort of where they've seen priority. That's um, roadside burns and the like. I think there's probably only been a handful, but that you know CFA really will help determine the priority of those, and we've facilitated that. Um, the other side of that is in the, the works that council have done. So that would include grading, slashing, and mulching on roadsides. Again, in consultation with the CFA. So using our fire management plan. Um, evaluating the conditions on those roads and then annually we meet with, with CFA uh, and determine where the priority works are. Um, what else? Carried out a review of the Roadside Conservation Management Plan. That's still to sort of get through to Council but that's happened uh, internally and that's been done for two reasons. One, to make sure it aligns with the current legislation and keeps up with any legislative changes but also to improve the balance between protecting or protecting biodiversity and the other roadside uses and objectives. Um, and, you know, fire management is, is obviously one of those. Um, we've also had free green waste disposal days at the transfer stations in the lead-up to the declared fire danger period. We do that annually to, to help residents, you know, dispose of stuff and clean up their properties. Um, and we also annually carry out fire inspections on private properties um, and serve clean-up notices where required. I can't quantify how many are, are served, but that, that's a suite of activities uh, that we would do sort of every season uh, in the lead up and, and hopefully that, you know, responds to the questions you posed. Okay. I can just say there's not a lot of evidence of action. Okay, I, second I can hear question. A, a lot of talking going on, a lot of meetings, a lot of paperwork, not much action. Uh, and I'd just like to ask there, if we can't, why of those 146 roads or whatever, why can't they be opened up to ratepayers to collect firewood so and Jeff, help clean them up. If you haven't got the resources, the townspeople, I think, yeah, would welcome so the Jeff, opportunity. We do have a firewood collection policy and that that's, um, was put out for public comment last year. Um, and again, it is that balance between, you know, the fact that people do go out and cut down trees, and I've seen evidence of that, versus the fact that we need habitat and we also need um, to have firewood available and clean the roadside. So it's trying to get that balance right. And, um, you know, I think that's that's the difficulty that we face with that one. But there is a firewood collection policy. And so I'd just encourage you to read that. And if, if you think it's not adequate, please make comment on that. That's fine. But your next question, please. Um, my next uh, question relates to consultants and uh, there have been comments in the, uh, in the press and there are wide comments in uh, the community, I believe, uh, not just around Beechworth, but in other, uh, in other centres, uh, about uh, the, uh, the very considerable and frequent use of consultants. And so uh, I've, uh, my question is, uh, will you explain why you are engaging in consultants to undertake work that ratepayers generally, I think, expect to be completed by staff as part of their routine work? And an explanation for the engagement of consultants to complete the master plan on Barmutha, on Barmutha Park would be a, a, perhaps a, a good case study in reply. Barmutha Park, uh, the, the council is designated as the manager for Barmutha Park. 
and I would like to know what action council is actually taking, other than in a collaborative sense, which diminishes its management responsibility, for, the, for its commitment to manage the park. Okay, so the question more broadly around consultants and in particular that plan, Trevor. So uh, can I, I'll answer the biomedical park but it's actually as a general question about consultants in general. Uh, your question sort of mentions uh, what community we expect in terms of what would be done by staff as part of the routine work. I'd probably turn around a bit and say, what does the community expect of uh, the organisation in terms of trying to keep costs as low as possible, which is our real goal. Our main, our main aim is to deliver on the council plan and deliver all the services that we provide to the community the community expects of us uh, at, at the most in the most efficient way. So that's, that's what we see as our goal, and my goal is running the organisation. And I certainly would always seek the lowest possible cost options in anything I do because it just makes my job harder if, uh, I, if I waste money on or something doesn't need to be spent on. Now, the reality is when you're hiring staff is that um, staff have ongoing costs and there's, there's awards and a whole range of things that go with having staff. And um, so we would always seek to keep our staff numbers, our permanent ongoing staff numbers as low as possible. It's true in council we'll have workloads that are quite variable. So you have peaks and you have troughs or peaks and valleys. If we, if we had uh, enough staff to do all the things we need to do in all the peaks when we have the troughs, we would be overstaffed, they'd be inefficient. So the best thing we can do then is to retain the minimum amount of staff possible just to do the bare basics of council. Uh, and then when we need additional resources for short periods of time, uh, and perhaps you might hire, I won't say consultants, but consultants and or contractors. Now, there's a lot of good reasons that they, that they happen and there's a lot of good reasons why they're an efficient use of resources and not something to be feared or not something to be, to be concerned about that they're actually inefficient. So there's a whole range of reasons. I'll go through a couple of them and I think they're pretty obvious to most when you hear them. Um, that um, often we may use contractors when we've got short-term temporary vacancies, so we've got permanent staff that are, are vacant. So in between the appointment of two, two permanent staff appointments, we'll have gaps. We'll, we'll employ contractors or consultants, or usually contractors, to fill temporary staff vacancies. We have uh, contractors or consultants that have specific expertise, and that expertise may only be used for a short period of time. So there's no point hiring these people on a permanent, ongoing basis when you don't need that particular expertise uh, most of the time. So you may only hire a, con a consultant or a contractor who has that expertise for a specific job and then you can let them go at the end of that contract. Um, sure, if you, if you find yourself rehiring after a while the same contractors to the point where you say, you know what, we can, we can um, justify a full-time position here, sure, you'll do that and you'll keep your costs slightly lower. But in the longer term, it's more efficient to, to buy them when you need them and let them go when you don't. And that's the balance we try to find all the time. Uh, sometimes we have contractors who actually are providing the work, the same work that staff can do, but it's just there may be workload issues. So you've got staff fully occupied on other strategies or other plans, um, but it may be the workload at that point in time is such that um, you can't do, do all work at the time. You need extra extra labour resources. So again, temporarily putting on staff to complete strategies or plans or anything that happens to be on the go at that time you hire the contractor uh, to get you through some peak work workload issues and then let them go again at the end of it. We also have other situations where we'll get specific grant funding. So there might be grant funding to do a certain thing uh, and that, and that um, hiring of a consultant or a contractor to do, to do that one-off thing would be fully funded by the grants. So it's, a, it's, it's, just, it's an ongoing process of finding the best balance, the best way to manage our limited resources in the most efficient way possible and finding a balance between permanent staff, temporary contractors and temporary consultants. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and our last question is from Helen McIntyre and Vivian <coughs> Harvey. Are you both coming? Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and everyone. I'm Helen McIntyre from Stanley and this is Viv Harvey from Beechworth. 
Our question is about the progress of the installation of water drinking fountains in Indigo Shire, like the water drinking fountains that have long been in Alpine Shire. Nearly three years ago, we put a submission to Council. The submission included models. Council responded by allocating a budget for this installation. However, there's been no progress that we're aware of. We haven't seen a map plan nor have been asked for water fountain site suggestions, but is this correct? So I'll hand over to Director of Infrastructure, Ian, Ian Ellett. I, I do believe we have installed some, but not as many as we'd like, but you're obviously not aware of them yet. Okay, so Ian? Yeah, look, thank you for your questions. Um, and I'm not sure I'll be able to cover them all, but look, certainly when you put your submission in about three years ago, which was to the council plan. So the, the council plan that was adopted um, identified increasing the water bubblers and it was ticked in, in each year. So it's been an ongoing program. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the third year of, of that council plan. There's been money allocated each year and I think the amount has been around 30,000 a year. It might have been 20 for one year. Um, so there is a program. It's disappointing that you haven't had visibility of it, so we need to correct that. Um, I think we'll be up to 34 installations by the end of this financial year. So there's, I think, about four at the moment that are still being rolled out. Um, oh, so they're, where they're, are they? They're across the towns. Well, I've got a big list here. I won't read it out, but I'm happy to catch up afterwards. We are working on, um, I don't think we've landed it yet, but just actually getting them mapped so that there's visibility on the website. Um, but look, I do have a list here. Of, you know, they're across the, the different towns. Uh, you know, not a whole lot in Beechworth or Stanley necessarily, but. Um, uh, is, is there one in Bedgeworth? Because the next part of the question is about the Easter Parade and availability of water to the expected that, thousands of Do you people. want to read that question, Helen? Because um, it was a bit beyond just uh, the water bubbles. What's the council plan for April's Easter Saturday parade crowd of hopefully thousands, <laughs> people coming back, um, re-access to drinking tap water to minimise consumption of plastic bottled water at that time? which was actually why Viv and I first put the submission in. We were horrified at what was going on there. So maybe, Mark, you might like to answer that one and then Ian can... Yeah, so thanks for, um, for the question. So our uh, events officer in the tourism space uh, works with a lot of uh, community organisations in the preparation of events. So the Golden Horseshoes, I think, is the one that you're referring to. Um, so uh, with all those quite large events, there's a whole lot of uh, protocols and expectations that the committees have and council has, and one of those is trying to eliminate um, the use of plastic uh, bottled water and to have some other alternatives available on that particular day. So I can't give you the details of what's coming up for Easter, but I I'm certainly uh, will re be reminding those officers to make sure that that's a priority for you for and the I'll festival. I'll just, um, well, we've got our manager of media and communications here, Mel. Um, it might be timely to uh, run some information around the water bubblers and what we have done with that program, because we've actually done a lot and it's unfortunate that you weren't aware no. of it. And obviously we're trying to do more, but um, we've had a fairly good start on it. So oh, that's um, we'll make very sure good that, to know. Yeah, we'll make sure that information gets out um, into the public, into the community, um, with plans of what's ahead as well. Okay. Um, Ian, did you want to just say whether there were bubblers in Beechworth? And then, Larry, you've obviously got a... Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So, look, just consulting the list I've got in front of me. So, in Beechworth at the moment, um, <coughs> there's the one near the post office, so at the corner of... Yes, Fort, the Fort and antique... Camp. Yeah, the um, antique repaired one. Repaired that, one. That's right. Uh, there's one it's, in the town hall gardens. It's rather hard for people to be aware that it is functioning, and that's what it is, but anyway. Yeah, and, and look, <laughs> I think what we've tried to do is, is recognise where there's, you know, ones like in front of the post office, not to replace that with something that's, that's not suitable mm. there. Mm. Um, be very mindful. The functionality that we're trying to introduce wherever we can is um, ones that are suitable for, for people in wheelchairs, ones that you can refill water bottles, ones with doggy bowls. So that's sort of the standard we're trying to get now. I think, you know, we yes. started the program with a few old ones in stock. So in the more remote places, we've probably got the more old-fashioned type. Um, but Town Hall Gardens near the Cenotaph... Uh, there's one down at Sandy Beach, so down at the facilities at, at Lake Sample. Um, one at Queen Vic Park near the kitchen. And by the end of this financial year, there one, will be one at Barmutha Park. 
but not, not a, at this time. So look, that's just to give a snapshot off Beechworth, but there's 34 on the list that we'll be down to by the end of this financial well, that year. that sounds great. Could, could I just comment that I walk through all those places and I've never noticed them, whereas the ones in, say, Alphine Shire are very, very visible and their value is indicated on yes. them as well. Um, I, I will just point out that we also have uh, some issues around uh, heritage and people being very concerned that we we put uh, bubblers that you might put in other towns. In Beechworth, in the main streets, there's concern around them not looking too out of place. So trying to get that balance. But yes, we take your point, absolutely. And um, I think hopefully by having a guide to where they are more publicly available, that would help with some of those issues. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right, so that finishes our questions. Thank you to all of the people that um, have asked and held us to account. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce a very special item, um, and that is that uh, at the um, Australia Day Awards, we had uh, a very special person awarded the, um, the Order of the Medal of Australia. The Medal of the Order of Australia, isn't it? Sorry, I'm saying it the wrong way around. And that is uh, Mrs Elizabeth Barrick, who's here with us tonight. Um, so would you like to come and stand up and I'll just talk about, about you for a minute. <laughs> and Elizabeth's here with her, with her husband, Peter. So Elizabeth uh, was awarded this, you know, very esteemed honour um, for her service to education and to the community. In education, it was for, as a communications tutor, speech, patholo speech pathology programs at Charles Sturt University since 2016, head teacher at Riverina Institute Albury Campus uh, in TAFE 1980s to 2011, and a former teacher, of course, from the Victorian Department of Education. In the community, Elizabeth was co-founder and past head of Toastmasters Toast Albury Wodonga, the past area director of North East Victoria for Toastmasters Victoria, the keynote speaker at the Australian Rehabilitation Nurses Association Annual Conference 2018, um, and her awards and recognition include Distinguished Toastmasters Award 2018 and the Eagle Award from Wodonga Council 1998. So we would like to congratulate you very sincerely, Elizabeth. Is, would you like to say a few words? I know we didn't ask you to prepare anything, so it's up to you. And if you would like a microphone. Oh, no, I'm happy. Um, no, I'm happy. Uh, the only thing is the community can hear you if you speak. Uh, yeah, we're live streaming, Elizabeth, so that, that way everyone can hear you, which would be terrific. Fine. Lovely. Lower. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor and councillors and visitors, people. Yes. Gallery. Community members. Right. Um, I was quite delighted, well, I was quite surprised when I first heard about it, but now I'm quite, I'm quite delighted and really honoured because I realise the ability to have this, an award like this and I've met some other people with awards uh, just recently at a meeting, at a dinner, and uh, it's just amazing what people have done in their careers and what they've done for people. And one of the first things that I did, and I really wanted to tell everyone, that I started teaching people to read because a lot of adults, even now, can't read and therefore can't write. And their whole career, their whole life, is gone, really. I mean, what would they do unless they've got a beautiful husband or, or a wife to help yeah. them? So that was probably the biggest thing and, and got involved very much with TAFE and Toastmasters, of course. 20 years with the Toastmasters. So. Thank you very much. I'm very Congratulations. pleased. Congratulations. Yes, we're very Thank proud. You. Thank, Thank you, Elizabeth. You. And before I uh, read out about the next um, awardee, I would also like to note that in our audience tonight, I believe there are two Order of Australia members of the Order of Australia. Is that right? Um, Joan Sims, you are, and Francis. And are there any others? Peter. So we have a very distinguished uh, community and we're very proud of all of you. Um, I would also like to then congratulate uh, Mrs Eileen Collins, who was awarded this on the Queen's Birthday Awards last year. 
Um, she is unable to attend tonight, but uh, she was also awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for service to conservation and the environment. Um, so Eileen was uh, the, the president of the Friends of the Chiltern Mount Pilot National Park, the founding member and convener since 1984, and the newsletter editor since 1993 of BirdLife Australia. She's a, a member of the Regent Honey Eater Recovery Team since, 19, since early 1990s. Uh, and a member since 1962 of Parks Victoria uh, and a volunteer for Healthy Parks, Healthy People currently. Um, and also in the Victorian National Parks Association, she has been a member since 2008. And the awards and recognition from there include the Best Friend Award for Victorian National Parks Association 2011 and the Kookaburra Lifetime Contribution Award, Parks Victoria 2000. And I had the great honour of um, meeting Eileen recently and, um, and she was showing me much of her work and she certainly has also made an amazing contribution to our area, in particular around conservation of wildlife and, and our natural, our very precious natural resources. So congratulations to you both and it's a great honour to have all of you here tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, a couple of the councillors said you're allowed to go if you want to. <laughs> Feel free if you've asked your questions or you've um, managed to sit. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So thank you everybody for that and it is really great when we get so much input from the community both in terms of your achievements and your questions to council and um, while we don't always enjoy it, it's actually really healthy that we have that process. Um, do I have any condolences? Councillor Price. Um, yes, I'd just like to speak about Kelvin Duke, who we unfortunately lost. Um, on Christmas Eve of last year, um, he was, as, as, as people have just spoken about, a, a tireless contributor to Chiltern and um, the rodeo community. He is a fundamental part of what people see as, as Chiltern in so many ways. He's involved in every, he was involved in every aspect of the community. Um, really happy to help people out to build something, uh, help to establish the rodeo, has been involved since its inception um, and has always been the one to bring the sound equipment to every event, happy to donate his time as MC, as an auctioneer, in, in any capacity because he, he was a really strong advocate for the town and for community and for, for getting things going. He was also a really strong presence for the junior competitors in that we were all involved with the race course, um, particularly in the rodeo area, and he really leaves a lasting impression on everything that's happened in that space. And, and certainly he was recognised by having the arena named in his honour in 2017. It's now the Kelvin Duke Arena. And so... I, th I think that we we would all just like to recognise him and the contribution that he's made. Um, I think that he would like me to say that you all need to get along to the next Chiltern Rodeo on the long weekend. That's that's his sh the show of support of him, and I'm I'm really pleased that Indigo Shire is able to support that event, um, and I think that we will continue to do so because of um, what he's established and and how strong it is in the committee that he's he's left behind to manage it. Um, so to his wife, Sharon, um, his sister and to his daughter, Roxy, as well, we pass on our sincere condolences. And Madam Mayor, can I ask that a letter of condolence be sent under seal to the Absolutely. family? Absolutely. Do I have someone to second that? Yes, I'll second that. Councillor Also, I'd also like to say that uh, he'll be a great loss. He, he used to come to drive back in time uh, and be the announcer and MC year after year after year. Even when he was really not well, he still made the effort. He'll be sadly missed throughout Indigo Shire. Yes. Councillor Murgott, did you want to add something then? Uh, no. I, I mean, I've known Kelvin for years and, and 
I've always been um, in awe of his energy because he did such a lot of work for children and um, I've known him for the 30 years I've been in children or for as long as he has. And, uh, you know, it's just something that is really sad and I hope, um, you know, he's, he's looking up down on us and sort of saying, well, keep on with that rodeo and keep everything going. Okay. Um, did you want to say something? Yes, CEO. Um, I don't usually speak at these ones, ma'am, and maybe if I, if I might. Yeah, of um, course. In my prior life at another council, but on the council, um, Calvin worked for myself as a compliance officer, and Calvin was 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 larger than life, one of the biggest characters you can ever come across at Wodonga, uh, at any council, really. Uh, he was in compliance, and he was actually famous for actually never infringing anybody at all, because uh, one of his amazing strengths was his strength of character and his strength, his way of going up to people and just and asking people to do the right thing and move along and do what they're supposed to do. And he had a way of getting everyone to comply without having to issue compliance notices. So he, uh, if, if you thought councils uh, try to make money out of these things, they don't. Uh, there's one compliance officer who made no money at all for council, but geez, <laughs> he was the best damn compliance officer that anyone could ever have. Okay, and we will certainly um, send that letter under seal to his family. Thank you, everybody, for that. Okay, so item seven is confirmation of minutes from the previous meeting. The recommendation is that Council confirm the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting held on the 17th of December 2019 as published on the website and confirm the minutes of the confidential session held on 17th of December 2019 as distributed separately. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Price, seconder. Councillor Murdoch, all those in favour? Carried. Item eight, business arising from the previous minutes. Uh, there were questions on notice that are now there. For anyone that's interested, they're actually in uh, on the website. You can read those there. Are there any other, is there any other business arising? Okay, deputations and petitions. Councillor Trenry, I believe you have a petition. I do, Madam Mayor. Um, if I can, I'll just read out um, the purpose of this petition. So it's the attached petition is for bitumen pavement in Melville, Melville Court, Yakandanda. Um, the person that created the petition was Gwendolyn um, Berkner. No one's ever heard of Gwendolyn, so it's Lynn Berkner for all those that know Lynn. Um, and it articulates why they need it, basically. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people signed, signed the document. So I'd like to move to present. Thank you. So we'll accept that as a table petition. Yep. Uh, all those in favour? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item 10.1 uh, is the January Finance Report and the recommendation is that Council accepts a year-to-date January Finance Report noticing the progress against Council's budget. Do I have someone to move that? Uh, Councillor Trenary, seconder. Councillor Murdoch. Do you wish to speak to that, Councillor Trenary? I'll just add a little bit. Um, I can assure you that uh, both Council and uh, Finance Committee has gone through a lot of these figures and a lot of questions have been asked. Um, as you'll see um, in the front end of the report that's presented, um, we are on track um, income year to date, expenses um, year to date. Um, we're on track, net position obviously, that means that's year to date, um, and capital works. Um, 1920 is higher than what it was in 1819, which is very important to note. Um, they're doing a great job um, getting a lot of work done this year, so I'd uh, be happy to recommend this report. Councillor Murdoch, do you wish to add anything? Just reiterate what uh, Councillor... Uh, Councillor Goldsworthy, then Councillor Shepherd. I just have a uh, question on note number five for employee costs. I wonder if the CEO could answer with a $376,000 favourable variance in relation to employee costs, has service delivery been affected at all? Uh, no, we don't believe so. And it, what normally happens in our budgeting process is, is that we, we budget um, to make sure there's enough money to cover all of our staff. Invariably, as the year goes on, we do have people leave. There are vacancies. Uh, some of that... Some of that um, saving would be offset by, um, as we spoke before about contractor costs, so there might be short-term temporary staff that are hired 
to fill some of those gaps. So you'll see a spin somewhere on another line to offset some of those. Some of those actually um, are gaps, and you have gaps people go on holidays, you, you get through, you still provide the services. So some of those will be covered that way. And um, and some of those will flow through to, to a saving in the year end figures. So next month we'll look at the um, mid-year report and I expect to see some of those savings coming through in the full year, but uh, no, there's no, there's been no impact on services, I believe, as a result of those um, savings. Okay, Councillor Shepherd. Yes, I was just interested in note number uh, 27, where we've got the unfavourable variance of 23,259 in IT. Um, I, we've had a bit of trouble this year with IT and some of the um, breaks we had. I'm just wondering, is that being fixed? Is it? Uh, is, is that what that's, that, that in, uh, variance is due to? Yes, so we've had a little bit of instability in mm. the servers and uh, the servers are now at the end of their, their life and uh, we've got a, a tender <coughs> out at the moment to replace the servers and we hope to be getting on with that project very soon. Great news. Can I ask another one? Of, oh, did you yes, certainly, follow-up question. Um, oh, I, so not, not, it's not a follow-up? Oh, sorry, no. well, Councillor Goldsworthy, was yours in relation to this? Okay. You have I was also going to ask about the unfavourable variance of the 89,872 in plant, fleet and equipment. So, Ian. Oh, that's um, uh, note number 20, page 134. Yep. While you're looking for that, Councillor Goldsworthy, did you have a different... Question to raise? Oh, it was just in relation to um, those that are really interested in our finances might note that we haven't got the mid-year budget review in this agenda. That will be uh, tabled at the next um, meeting of council, hopefully. Thank you. So, yeah, look, the, the note there on plant, fleet and equipment is, is just, it's about predicting utilisation um, mm -hmm. because we we use it and then it's charged back to, to other accounts. Um, so if utilisation is a bit down, we make adjustments uh, across the year. And, and so they're things we, we monitor, we adjust the, the charge out rate. So that budget by design will is probably one that we can predict will come in on budget at the end of the year, but its impact on other accounts is is uncertain. It's moved, plant and fleet and equipment, well, plant and equipment is used sort of across the, the maintenance budgets and the capital budgets. Um, and look, there's a, uh, a workforce out there that, that uses it. So we're, we're pretty comfortable at the year's end that um, it, it should come in you know, okay. close to predicted. Great, thank you. Okay, any other items for the January finance report? Any other questions, comments? Okay, Councillor Trenary, do you wish to sum up? No, I think Council did a really good job. Okay, so Council accepts the year-to-date January <laughs> finance report. All those in favour? Carried. Item 10.2 is planning permit 19.0... Oh, sorry, yes, Councillor. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, in relation to the dwelling in farming zone 261 Old Stanley Road, Beechworth. Councillor Price. Um, could I ask that this item be deferred until uh, the next meeting so that a site visit can be conducted by councillors? Certainly. Does anyone want to second that? Could I ask a question while I speak up? Sure. You need your microphone on. Yep, certainly. Yep. What would be the implications from a planning perspective for us to adjourn it? Are there time limitations on this? Is this to uh, Director Pinkerton? Yep. Okay. So Council does have a statutory time for determining permits, uh, beyond which the, an applicant could take um, action in VCAT to, um, uh, for failure to determine. Um, having said that, I think if this is deferred for a site visit, it's it's very likely to come back to the next meeting, which is a heck of a lot quicker than any VCAT timeline that I've seen recently. So um, I don't believe that there would be um, a huge risk to defer that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Shepherd? Uh, no, it hasn't been seconded. Seconded. Do you want to do it with the microphone so it's recorded? I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak to this item? Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm also very keen to have a site visit on this project. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions? So the motion is that this be deferred until the next meeting to allow for a site visit by councillors. 
All those in favour? Carried. Right. Item 10.3 is PP190174, Development Plan for a 10-lot subdivision, Forest Lane, Beechworth. The recommendation is, yes, Councillor Gold, uh, Councillor Gaffney. To adjourn. I'm happy to move this, Councillor. Uh, Mayor. To move the recommendation? Yep. As is? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, basically, I'd better say what it is first. Yes. So, it is that the attached draft development plan be endorsed as an approved development plan for the purposes of section 43.04 of the Indigo Planning Scheme, subject to a range of notes, which there are eight of them. I won't read them all out, uh, but given that councillors have that in front of them, and it is available on the website, of course, and I think there are hard copies there. So, the recommendation is moved by Councillor Gaffney. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Murdoch, anyone else wish to speak to this? Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor? I can, unless there's nobody against. Well, you can speak to it first and I'll right, put it sure. to the vote. This draft development plan has been assessed against the relevant decision guidelines of the development plan overlay and it is considered to be an appropriate outcome for the site and locality. The planning department recommends that Council resolved to approve the development plan subject to the notes uh, mentioned in this item. Uh, I'd also like to mention one line, um, one paragraph in the recommendation, and that is that this plan is conceptual and may be subject to minor change following further detailed design in relation to stormwater treatment and in particular conveyance and detention and any subsequent plan of, sub, of subdivision must be generally in accordance with the approved development plan. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Murdoch, do you wish to speak as a seconder? Uh, no, I think uh, Councillor Gaffney summed it up nicely. Uh, it has been around for quite a long time since I've been on Council, I think, in the, the background, and uh, it's finally come to fruition. Okay. All right, so I put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. Uh, 10.4 is the grants policy. The recommendation is that Council adopt the grants policy 2020. Again, this is outlined in the agenda. Uh, do I have someone to move that? Councillor Price, do I have a seconder? Councillor Murdoch, do you wish to speak to this, Councillor Price? Um, yeah, I think this is really important. This has been a, a lot of our discussion uh, across a council term amongst councillors and staff is about uh, grant funding because we're so reliant on it and about what we're ready to apply for, how we decide whether we make an application or not, whether we're shovel ready for something. Um, and so I think that it's really important that we have a clear policy which, is, which establishes exactly what we expect um, as councillors and what, what we should expect from the staff. Um, it, it needs to take into consideration a, a number of things, um, financial decision making and the risk management. Um, but I think it's, it's a really good guiding document for us to know uh, what we could reasonably expect to apply for when things come up. Um, as I again say that we're so dependent on grants here um, as a small rural shire, so I'm pleased to see this policy come up. Okay. Uh, Council Murdoch, do you wish to add anything to this? No, I think uh, it's been well said. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you, councillors. Okay, 10.5 is Local Law 3, Meeting Procedures and Common Seal. The recommendation is that Council adopts the attached Local Law Number 3, which is the Meeting Procedure and Common Seal 2020, Authorises the CEO to affix the common seal to Local Law 3 and authorises the CEO to advertise the adoption of Local Law Number 3 and finalise any matters in relation to Local Law 3 required by the Local Government Act. Do I have someone to move that? I'm happy to move that with an amendment. Certainly. Do you want to put the amendment? Yep, sure. Um, in Open Forum, page 15, paragraph 31B which talks about visitors present at an 
ordinary meeting of council may ask up to three questions of council but shall do so only after having submitted those questions in writing by the earlier of 1 5 p.m. on the day of the meeting or to 90 minutes prior to the commencement of the meeting. I would like to add a paragraph uh, or at the discretion of the chair. And the only reason that I put that in is if somebody wants to bring it by hand and lives at places like Sandy Creek or Wedgunya uh, to get here 90 minutes prior to and then sort of wait around might be difficult. Yeah. And there's another amendment uh, regarding points of order on page 31, paragraph 65. where it says the point of order may be taken on the grounds that the matter is, and it then talks about seven issues. I would like to add that um, uh, con condition number eight, that a point of order can be made if matters raised are not factual. Okay, so... Recommendation is that the motion now is that council adopts as I previously read out and that we add in um, that there be an amendment added in that, uh, regarding the questions in open forum that it is also at the discretion of the chair and that the um, points of order include if if it, uh, if it is not factual, if the statement if, made is not factual? Yes. Okay. Yes. Councillor Goldsworthy. So the determination of what's factual and what's not and how will we determine that in a time-efficient manner? Councillor Gaffney? Well, in the state and federal parliament, points of order are made on this <coughs> on almost a daily basis. So I think it would be wrong. So um, I think if somebody has got facts to say that what is being said is not factual and they can prove that, that's a, a, certainly a ground for point of order. I thought it might have fitted into... Um, uh, to paragraph five, which constitutes improper behaviour, but I think it's an important issue and it needs to be itemised. Yep. Councillor Shepherd. It's not seconded yet, this amendment, is it? No. I just have a question to Greg around that, if, uh, uh, around that, that, that extra addition there about the fact, whether it's a fact, whether you uh, support that whether you could speak to that, whether it would work, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I support that. I, I think the, the question is about how that operates in the meeting. And so um, I, I think the principle is, is a very good one. Um, I, I think, though, it would need to be something that uh, would only be a point of order if it could be verified in the meeting um, and not an extra process because you want the debate and you want the, the meeting to continue without having to adjourn it to check the facts. Uh, and Madam Mayor, can I just add to that answer, please, just if I can, and then you yeah, can continue. Just open an email. So uh, if, if there's a point of order, the, the chair, the mayor rules on it. So if um, it's trivial or um, if the facts are um, reasonably close, we're point six of a percent out, then the mayor can rule on that. Okay. And I think that's that's the end result. And I guess that what appears to be the case is that you're putting forward something that says that we need to uh, speak to correct information, that that's, yeah. Okay, so, Councillor, did you want to add something there? Uh, just on that section 65, oh, uh, sorry. It, might, it might be simpler if, if point eight just says a statement that is verifiably incorrect. Do you support that wording? Yes, I do. All yes. right. So, all right. So we'll put now that um, that the new point under point of order is that the addition of a new part to allow for a point of order in cases where the matter is a statement that is verifiably incorrect. Yes. Okay. Does everyone uh, understand now what the motion is? Okay. I'm going to put the motion. Oh, second. Is there a seconder for the motion? Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. I'll put the motion. All those in favour. Carol, do you want to speak to it? Yeah. I apologise. Go ahead. I do want to speak to it. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Um, Go. Just um, 
I just wanted to point out to Robin McLeish that we've added a little bit that um, he was concerned about where you can now put ask a question and um, not be here. So um, a small change to allow for a person who cannot make the meeting to nominate a representative who can ask their question for them. So I remember you asked that quite a while ago. So it's in, and we've had to wait until the local law has been reviewed to get that in, but you've, you're in there. Um, and uh, were you happy to speak about how we're going to be doing the open forum? Yes, I will. Um, but before I do that, I think Councillor Goldsworthy wants to add something. Oh, okay. All right, so the other thing that I think is important to uh, make people aware of is that if... I'll, I'll do it if we adopt the motion, basically. If we adopt the motion, then the order of, of which we run the agenda is different. Um, and we will be uh, having public forum at the end of the meeting. And the reason for that is that often people raise issues at the beginning of the meeting that are going to be dealt with during the meeting. So we're now going to um, have questions at the end so that people have actually heard the outcomes and then get an opportunity to ask questions. So that's going to be the new order. We're going to trial that. Um, there's nothing in local law that says we have to do it that way. It's just something councillors are keen to try. So we will try, we'll do these things on a trial basis and if, if the community doesn't find it useful, then we, we can change it back. Um, okay, so I'm going to... Oh, did you want to ask a question before we put the motion? Oh, okay, please. I just have concerns with that last um, point, point eight that was uh, put in there um, for a couple of reasons. One, I wasn't aware that that one was uh, coming at us, so prefer there not to be surprises, um, whether it was emailed out or not. Um, I must have missed that one. Uh, I'd like to think I didn't. I saw one uh, from Greg that related to an amendment. Um, my, my concerns, actually, uh, the point of order um, where it talks about it is taken when a council officially draws attention of the chairperson to an alleged irregularity or breach in the proceedings. Um, and then we'll determine things on... Um, well, the wording was uh, whether it was factual or not or, or whether there's um, justifiable to, to say that it's not factual. Um, it, you're the chair at the moment. There may be a different chair in the future. Um, may or may not believe in something uh, and deem that an argument may well be uh, not factual and therefore allows a point of order. And I'm just concerned that it allows for any interruption to somebody's talking and the point that they're trying to make. Um, I see no uh, great hurry in passing this. I, I think it's a worthy point to argue that uh, what's stated by councillors should be factual. Um, I'm just not sure it fits in that point of order um, part. So I, I just wonder if we can defer it until the next meeting we have a discussion in between time. So are you going to put an alternate motion to defer Local Law 3? Well, what I'd suggest is that we don't pass this motion um, and then after it's not carried, we then defer it. That, that's my... Well, so um, I would suggest you actually put a motion to defer and let councillors vote on that. Well, you've got an active motion table at the moment. So it's either... Yeah, so you're putting an alternate motion is my question. No, my, an alternate motion would be something similar that it was substantive in nature to the original motion, which this wouldn't be. I'm saying uh, we should defer it, so... I'm happy for this motion to be decided and if it's um, decided in the negative, we should adjourn it for one month in order to discuss yep. it. Okay. So I'll put the motion. If it's decided in favour, it will go through. If not, then you can put the alternate motion. Okay. So I'm putting the motion all I'd those... I'd like to Sorry. sum up, Adam Mayor. Go. Sum up. Very surprised that Councillor Goldsworthy said that he didn't have any... Um, he didn't have any knowledge of it and uh, that he didn't like surprises and this was a surprise. If he had attended the briefing meeting, like all of the other councillors were, it was discussed there, but you chose not to be there. So that's your fault, not mine. Um, this is a very minor amendment. Um, I think it's an important, <laughs> important amendment. I'd like to point He's talking on over me. Uh, just, OK, I'm going to accept a point of order there. Um, it's not about apportioning blame to anybody. You don't know the reasons Councillor Gaffney didn't attend and no. councillors aren't required to attend briefings, so the fact that he wasn't there is entirely reasonable. Um, the fact that he didn't know about it is uh, equally... You said it was his fault for not coming, so I'm just going to correct you on that. Um, going back to the motion, um, I think uh, we're now at the point of... You were summing up? Yep. Yep, OK. Uh, I don't
don't think it's a big change, but I think it's an important change. And um, if somebody is saying something that you know is factually incorrect and you can't point of order, um, I think it just makes it, ver it makes it very difficult, particularly if you've already spoken about it and you can't speak again. The only way you can be heard is by a point of order. Okay, thank you. All right, so anyone else wish to speak? You've summed up. I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour of passing with the um, amendments that Councillor Gaffney put forward? All those in favour? Um, against? It's been carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, 10.6. Assembly of Councillor Records. Uh, the recommendation is that Council accepts the attached Assembly of Councillor Records. Do I have someone to move that? Thank you, Councillor Price. Seconder, Councillor Shepherd. Anyone wish to speak to that? Again, all of that's available uh, on the website if you wish to read through the Assembly of Councillors Records. I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you. Item 11.1 .1 is the recommendation that Council adopts the 2020 Swimming Pool Development Plan update. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Goldsworthy, do I have a seconder? Councillor Murdoch, do you wish to speak to it, Councillor? Now, swimming pools are a very uh, important community asset. Um, we have five of which uh, we try and maintain as best we can. We know that uh, most of them were built in the 70s. Uh, one in particular is in a serious state of decay and will need uh, urgent uh, repairs or rebuild uh, within coming the short-term future. Um, so I think this goes some way to addressing that. Uh, we certainly had um, a lot of submissions in relation to it. A lot of people in Beechworth are looking to get a, a heated aquatic facility that would be uh, indoors. Uh, I'm not sure on the realities of, of that and the potential funding um, concerns or avenues that we might be able to pursue in that, but certainly the majority of this um, speaks to an important community asset, something that's used and uh, fits in with a lot of our other strategies like ageing well. So for that reason, I support this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Murdoch, do you wish to speak to this? Um, just to say that I agree with uh, Councillor Gaffney, <laughs> Councillor Goldsworthy, sorry, um, is, is that we do need a development plan for these, um, for our pools and, and how we look after them and how we um, work out, you know, what we're going to do with them. If, if one's starting to break down or if, if uh, there are reasons that we need to put in replacements or repairs or any of that, we need to have a plan in place for what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Shepherd. Um, I know we've been discussing a water play area for a while and, I, and it's, it's been said that we're going to do it somewhere. I'm just wondering how we're going to ascertain where that somewhere is. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So there's, um, we'd need to be some assessment of uh, the demographics, I suppose, where's the, the likely use going to come from? So where our younger... Um, population maybe be involved there. What else is uh, available closer by and um, working out where's the best uh, location. So there's a bit of a process around that. So there'll be a criteria of some description? Of yeah. some description, yeah, with right. community input into that as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other comments on this motion? Anyone else wish to speak? Yes, Councillor. Sorry, there's just another thing. Um, it's great to see that um, accessibility modifications is going to allow for disability access into the pools. It's um, I, and I'd, I'd assume some the access committee probably had some input into that. So that's um, great that it's happening. Okay, all right. So I put the motion that council adopts the 2020 swimming pool development plan update. All those in favour? Carried. Thanks, councillors. 11.2 is the early year strategy 2020 to 2025. And again, the recommendation is that council adopts the early year strategy 2020 to 2025. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Price, a seconder. Councillor Shepherd, Councillor Price. Um, although this is probably not roads, rates or rubbish. Uh, I think for, that we can see from the community engagement that we, that's taken place on this, this is certainly something that is 
um, a real priority within our community. Um, council established that this was something that was going to go into the council plan um, to set out a strategy and uh, that's what we've now done in line with the state government early years reform, education state early childhood reform plan. Um, we've had a lot of consultation including 117 Indigo Shire families completing an online survey. Um, obviously this came to us in December and then uh, was brought to our attention by a community member that um, we'd missed some consultation in Wagunya and so we've, we're very pleased that that was brought to our attention and we were able to rectify that and, and go back and consult with the community over there, um, which is, is a strong community that's got a lot of young families there now, so it's really important that we do hear from them. Um, I think that the guiding vision for the strategy is really important and it talks about children are happy, healthy and safe in their communities. Families are supported in raising a family and have access to the services and support they need for children. Indigo Shire is inclusive, connected and child friendly. Every child has an equal and best start in life. Children participate in the community and are engaged in decisions about services and infrastructure that impact on them. So as I say, far and away from Roads, roads, rates and rubbish, but certainly something that we see as a real priority. Um, I think that this is a real foundation for our community that, that we say that we um, put children in their early years as, as a priority for us as a council, um, and I think that this strategy does that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Shepherd. Uh, I think this has been um, a great community engagement, and I um, appreciate that from the survey we had the, all the positives about what a great place it is to raise a family, but they also said, people said it was hard to find information on available services, activities and programs that travel and affordability impacts on their ability to participate in activities and programs, and that there are limited childcare options and spaces, lack of specialist health services, and limited activities available in Indigo Shire. So they're now all on our list for things that we're going to tackle. So I just appreciate the fact that uh, when the community have an input, we're able to then action it. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Do you want to add anything, Councillor Price? Yeah, just that we're really active in that space with um, playgroups and child cares. That's certainly something that's been brought up through our whole council term. Um, the importance of having those services available in towns. It, it then has a flow-on effect to our schools um, and, and to, to us attracting families to our towns. So um, I'm really pleased to see that we're active in that space and um, I commend the strategy. Okay. I'd like to put the motion that council adopts this strategy. All those in favour? Carried. And I'd also like to uh, thank the staff that were involved um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind passing on our thanks to your team who've done a, a really great job in engaging with the community around this issue. 11.3 uh, is the play space review and strategy 2020 to 2030. <coughs> the recommendation is that council adopts the play space review and strategy. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Goldsworthy, do I have a seconder? Councillor Price. Councillor Goldsworthy. So this strategy was developed in conjunction with the early years uh, strategy. It's something that uh, I've pressed for um, from the start of my term here that we look at our uh, recreation and play spaces for our children. Uh, it's extremely important. I think uh, things of note that have come out of it is uh, the population to uh, the number of parks that we have and it certainly highlights that at Yakandanda there's a shortage of play space uh, down there. Uh, it also... Um, recognises that we should build a regional play space. Uh, hopefully that'll go into Chilton and certainly make that a destination for people coming in off the highway and hopefully uh, introduce new business to the Chilton area. Uh, and as well, it addresses uh, local play spaces, uh, those that need um, some work done to them and, and those that uh, in the future probably need to be decommissioned. So it is an important strategy. It gives us some strategic justification for grants and I commend it to this council. Thank you. Council Price. Yeah, I think, I think this is a really important piece of work because um, these play spaces within our communities become meeting, meeting spaces um, where, where families get together. And the other interesting thing that I always find is that 
they sometimes fill a gap for our youth as well. They might not have equipment there that are suitable for that age range, but you still see that people are are uh, um, gathering in that space. So I think that they serve a really important function um, and I'm pleased to see that the, the consultation was able to be done side by side with the early years plan. I think that's that makes sense and it's good to see that it's done that way when it can, can be done that way. Um, so really pleased to see this come to us. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. Thanks, councillors. Item 11.4, the Rather Glen Destination Management Structure Review. Um, the recommendation is quite a long one, um, but I will read through it. The, council, the recommendation is that Council notes and receives the final Rather Glen Destination Management Report 2020, uh, incorporates Rather Glen Visitor Information Centre into its visitor and industry services operation, works with the business and industry sectors of Rutherglen Glen to establish a business forum entity, authorises the CEO to establish an implementation committee and to conduct an appropriate recruitment process for that committee, including an independent chairperson, requires the CEO to commence the process to wind up the operations of the Rutherglen Glen Wine Centre Board Special Committee of Council and associated memorandums of understanding between the various parties noting that this will require a further decision of Council to rescind the instrument of delegation, requires the CEO to support Destination Rather Glen Inc in assessing and de determining its future, supports the continuation of Destination Marketing, being the responsibility of Council's Tourism Unit, Tourism North East and Winemakers of Rather Glen, with input from business and industry sectors, confirms the performance measures by which the review changes and Council's investment will be assessed, authorises the CEO to establish discussions with the winemakers of Rutherglen on the future options for the wine experience building and considers the sale of wine at the Rutherglen Visitor Information Centre during the implementation period. Do I have someone to move that motion? Councillor Goldsworthy, do I have a seconder for that motion? Okay, no seconder. Councillor Shepherd. Councillor Goldsworthy. If it fails, yes, yeah, sure. Okay, Councillor Goldsworthy. So why is change required? Uh, Vince Pracy at the start of this report, the structure is fragmented and inefficient. The ongoing lack of growth in overnight visitation share is impacting growth of the visitor economy and environment of growth elsewhere. 10% of the total spending in Rutherglen goes to accommodation, which demonstrates the disproportionate day visitor ratio. Visitor spend was $26 million in 1819. That equals $113 spend per visitation average, compared to the regional Victorian average of overnight spend visitors of $376 over a three-night stay. The lack of connection with the industry, 83% of which all businesses in Rutherglen are not members of Destination uh, Rutherglen or winemakers of Rutherglen equates to 286 of the total 346 businesses. The lack of connection engagement with council services, ECADEV, marketing, business development, and ineffective marketing at local level, the destination rather than expenditure, 4.7% of total income on marketing in 2018-19. Payroll was 10 times out of the marketing expenditure. It speaks perfectly as to why this needs to be passed. Okay, uh, Councillor Shepherd. <coughs> Did you want to, as seconder, do you wish to speak? Are there other people to speak? I reserve you my right. You can reserve your right. Yeah, sure. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? For or against? Yeah, Councillor Trenary. I'll speak against the motion if I can. Sure, Councillor Trenary. Um, it, it's very simple. We want more people to visit Rutherglen and more efficiently. Um, taking over the VIC is unbelievable in its added costs and its waste of money when we're just trying to get more people there. I mean, when we, when we go through the figures, and it was interesting the figures that Councillor Goldsworthy went through, he didn't mention there's $15,000 put into events by the Visit Information Centre and that organisation we want to get rid of, $15,000. If we take over that, we're going to spend $16,000 on IT that we could be putting into marketing. 
there's wages there of about $85,000, which is amazing considering a, a community coordinator, basic, gets about 84000 and we're going to have 1.4 of the most junior people in um, the VIC and it's going to turn everything around. It doesn't make sense. What we need to do is um, increase our marketing and work with these volunteers. We can do it as a council to work with volunteers to have a marketing plan. Why on earth do we have to buy a VIC and spend huge amounts of money to come up with a marketing plan? These volunteers work their butts off in the community and help the community, have a direct link to the community and have done a fantastic job. There is things that need to improve. Getting rid of them doesn't improve them, it gets rid of them. I, I think that um, the report that we received was a more of a sales document than a report. I, I, I was absolutely astounded by it. Um, I can't think of any rhyme or reason for us to spend that money, waste that money when we could actually be achieving something with it. Um, I'll leave the rest for the next debate that I'm sure is coming. Okay, anyone else wish to speak? Yes, Councillor Gaffney. The Indigo Shire Council spends $1.742 million on tourism. The Beechworth Visitor Information Centre, the cost to council is 324000 With Rutherglen VIC, the cost to council is $147,000. The cost per visitor to the Beechworth VIC is $3.23 per, per visitor. In Rutherglen, it's $2.29. The income to the Beechworth Visitor Information Centre, who has a lot more traffic than Rutherglen, have got an income of $41,900. Yet Rutherglen has an income of $165,000. It's obvious which is the more efficient, yet Inigo Shire wants to take over the running of the Rutherglen VIC. I notice on item 10 uh, that the council considers the sale of wine at the, at the Rutherglen Visitor Information Centre during the implementation period. Does that mean that the Inigo Shire Council is going into competition with Dan Murphy's and BWS? or BSW, whatever it's called, in the sale of liquor. We would be the only shire throughout Australia who would want to go into the liquor business. It's against all of the principles of this council. It talks about a chair, an independent chair. I presume that that chair would be paid and I don't know whether the members would be paid. The cost to the ratepayers of Inigo Shire if this, if this went ahead, I would hate to think. The building, the RWE, who we're authorising the CEO to talk to the winemakers, needs $180,000 to bring it up, up, up to scratch. For us to buy it, uh, I just can't imagine. Uh, I agree with all of the comments of Councillor Trenary, and as I foreshadowed, if this motion fails, I'll move an alternative motion. Okay, anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Murdoch. Yeah, um, I'd just like to agree with both the previous speakers in that um, one of the, well, I think one of the beautiful things, or if, if we like to say it that way, is the volunteers in the Shire. We have some fantastic volunteers. And when I, I go through, you know, Chilton, where I come from, um, and, and rather, Glenn, I often uh, drop in just to see what they're doing and we have so many volunteers there. They do a fantastic job. Why would we want to change it? Which will probably in the long run cause... Um, well, I, I think what will happen is it will cause people to not want to volunteer there and then we'll end up having to put a bigger... So bit. I've got a question for clarification, uh, maybe to Mark Florence actually. So in the recommendation here it is that the VIC is uh, comes under uh, 
Indigo Shire Council. My understanding is that all the VICs in Indigo Shire use volunteers. Is there any? Is there any? I'm, I'm unclear about why the statements being made that we would lose volunteers from the VIC when they currently are in all our VICs. So can you just clarify that for me? Yeah, that's correct. So all of the Yakandanda, Chiltern, um, Beechworth and Rutherglen, there are large numbers of volunteers that um, work with uh, the visitors and provide the services that VICs provide. Okay, so again, for clarification to Councillor Gaffney, you were making that claim, Councillor. Is that claim actually factually correct? That we would lose the volunteers from the VIC? I didn't say that. But uh, what's the number of volunteers at the Rutherglen VIC compared to the Beechworth VIC? And I ask that question knowing the answer, but I'd like to hear it from the director. Well, maybe you can answer it if you know the... <laughs> Do you know the answer? I don't have the exact numbers, so I'll ask the... The councillor to provide the exact numbers. Yeah. Do you want to provide them? I think you'll find that uh, it's double at Rutherglen. I think it's uh, probably 2021, and I think Beechworth's got about nine or ten. Uh, I'm just talking about the VIC. I'm not talking about the Burke and Historic Precinct, but um, uh, that also has a cost of 751,000. Sorry, the, oh, the Burke Museum. But that's separate to this yep. issue. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, any other questions, comments? Um, Councillor Price. I'd like to speak to I'll certainly speak to the motion, yeah. Um, I've certainly agonised over this decision because I think that what we can all agree on is the premise. The, the reason that we decided to do this review is because we were unhappy with the structure um, and we wanted to really put a focus on... Rutherglen and tourism in Rutherglen and make sure that we can um, make sure that the, the structure really suits that. My concern now is that we don't fully understand everything that Destination Rutherglen represents to the community and I understand that's separate to the function that they, um, that they should provide in, in terms of tourism but I would be hesitant to disrupt that by removing uh, them as an organisation to, re to replace them with a, with a higher level uh, board. I think that it's really important that we have a strong connection with Rutherglen and I think that is predominantly through Destination Rutherglen. Um, and I'm, I'm uncertain that we have tried every avenue to best support them uh, to, to focus and, and, and to support them with all the things that our tourism staff are, have expertise in um, and, and such as the destination marketing. I'm still uncertain about the state of the Visitor Information Centre. Uh, I think that through my engagement with the Rutherglen Wine Centre board meetings that I've been to, I can see that they've run a very effective model over there. I could also see that there would be some benefits to bringing them under um, Indigo Shire's Visitor in Industry Services operation. I, th I, th I think that in considering this, as I say, we're, we're being asked to consider it from a tourism perspective, but it's it's grown into so much more and we've we've come to understand the role that Destination Rutherglen plays in terms of community and in terms of tourism in, in Rutherglen. Uh, and so I can no longer consider it in just that isolation and be confident that we would be able to fill the gap that Destination Rutherglen ha um, is, is in, in Rutherglen. I think that's all I'll say for this moment. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Uh, do you want to sum up, Councillor Goldsworth? You did. I didn't. I didn't see. Oh, I apologise. Would you like to? Sure. Um, I'm also conflicted. I've been following this right from the word go. I haven't been on any of those committees. I've only been able to hear from your perspective how they run. Um, I often hear they're not well, all that well run. And so that has been of concern to me around what decisions come out of it. It seems convoluted, the system of how it all works. I've never been able to get my head around how it works. It doesn't seem very simple. 
In terms of simplifying things, this looks to simplify things, but of course when you're simplifying things, what you're getting rid of is a large area of um, complicated community supported independent uh, uh, people who are involved in some great things in Rutherglen. And I notice also in a lot of the uh, uh, strategies and, and, and um, uh, when, when we have to ask for feedback, Destination Rather Glen is always the people we go to, is the name on the list of stakeholders to get feedback on what's happening in Rather Glen. Um, and they, we see them as the representatives of Rather Glen. Now, um, so even though I want it simplified, I do want Rather Glen to move ahead uh, in terms of overnight accommodation and I want measurable difference. I want to be able to see that if we change this system, we are going to get more overnight stays in Rother Glen and that we are going to get more businesses and community engaged around tourism. So I want that to be um, a measurable item that we can see because the destruction that we're causing by breaking something down needs to be, it, the, the result needs to be worth what we're, what we're destroying, I suppose, because it is, um, you know, I, we've had lots of emails of people saying, especially community groups saying how important they also are for tourism. And we know that, we know that the local tourism groups give the, give the essence that they might not be the big overarching events that happen, but they're the reason why people stay, come and visit because there's an art show on or a flower show or, or there's, you know, a, a great shop to go to. So those things are also important. So I, I, I understand that Destination Rather Green also does the um, communicating and supporting of that group with council. So that's where my concern lies in Destination Rather Glen being um, taken away. What have we got left if we've got a higher in, um, committee that has um, people on it that um, are representative wine, of the wine, of um, business, of council? What, what then happens to those other groups? How are they represented at council? That's... I'm, I'm unsure who can answer, answer that. I can perhaps ask Mark um, if he's got an answer to that because otherwise I, I support this, um, especially if there's measurable results. Can you, do you want to answer that question about who would be supporting uh, the businesses and community that are not at the high end? Is that, was that your question, yeah. Councillor? By um, the, the newly formed committee, I assume. Uh, so I think we need to be clear that the newly formed committee is for the implementation committee, which would be a four-month um, process. Um, the business entity forum um, is a framework to be established that would engage with business and industry at a far greater rate than um, is currently being provided. Uh, in terms of the community uh, groups and how they're connected and how they feel supported, um, in many respects that's a process for the community itself to, to work through and council has made the decision that a place-making process be taken place at Rutherglen in the next financial year, which can have included in it a... Um, uh, a bringing together of all the community groups, all the various institutions and individuals to, uh, to work through what is a sustainable model for community connection and integration for events or uh, general programs. So I think there is opportunities there for that space to be, to be filled. A follow-up question, Council? Yes. Um, so can we somehow have that in writing around the place... <laughs> about the place name because it could be forgotten in the process that that's one of the aims of that uh, place making. Yeah, certainly it can be um, included, that specific part can be included at um, great depth in the brief that gets created for the formation of the project, which that place making project will be a 12 to 18 month project. Okay. Councillor Goldsworthy, do you want to sum up? 
So I understand the concerns about those community groups and the assistance that they've had um, over the years uh, from the destination management structure. We've got to remember why we've actually commissioned this report and why we've uh, paid a lot of money to a consultant. And it's to establish an optimal destination management organisation and structure and it's to assist council to focus investment in the Rutherglen destination management model. We've had significant advocacy from both sides of the fence, those that uh, don't want change and those that do, and, and some of those uh, on both sides are key players in uh, the Rutherglen community, so it's a vexing question for them as well for us. But I think what we've got to uh, remember is why we've uh, commissioned this review. We've got an expert in, they're telling us their expert advice, they're giving us options. We've been in step with them the whole way through. I know that a couple of the councillors have been to many of the meetings and heard what's been said. Um, so. Uh, yeah, you know, like some of the councillors here have been on the council for 10 years. If, there's, if they've recognised an issue, what have they done about it? Um, this is our solution as a council to say we, we need to assist the Rutherglen community in uh, changing for the better. This is all about trying to make it better for them. And if it does cost more money in the long run and it makes it better, that's what we've got to do. Okay, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour of... The recommendation as previously read. All those in favour? Two, three. Okay, all those against? Four. It lapsed. So, Councillor Gaffney, did you want to put up an alternate motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The motion is that Council, one, notes and receives the final Rutherglen Destination Management Report 2020. Point two is out, point three is out, point four is out, point five is out, point six is in. Point six is requires the CEO to support Destination Rutherglen Inc. in assessing and determining its future. Point seven, that council supports the continuation of destination marketing being the responsibility of Council's Tourism Unit, Tourism North East, the winemakers of Rutherglen, input from the business and industry sec sectors, and with Destination Rutherglen. This will be a change. It'll be, oh, well, I'll speak to it later. Um, point eight is out, point nine is out, point 10 is out. I don't think Indigo Shire should be involved in the selling of alcohol. That's the motion, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, if you, uh, it's it's all there. It's so I'll just I'll just make sure this is correct. It uh, if you look at the current recommendation, uh, it, one remains point one, point two, three, four, and five are out. Point six remains. Point seven remains with the addition of and with de destination rather, Glenn. Yes. Ink. Yep. Uh, eight, nine and ten are out. Yes. So, uh, do I have a second of that motion? I'll second that motion. Oh, Councillor Trenary. Uh, where am I? Okay. So, uh, Councillor Gaffney. We're talking about um, to get more tourists there, to, um, to have more overnight stays. Uh, if you look at the more prominent shops in Beechworth, there's certainly more prominent shops closed than at Rutherglen. So things aren't working out for the best here at all. There's been a slump uh, in tourism because of, of the fires and threats of fires and smoke. Destination Rutherglen have always had the feeling, whether it be right or, or wrong, that they're left for, um, to cope for themselves. Destination Rutherglen is the only voice that Rutherglen's got in a big way. The winemakers are interested in the winemakers. I'm sure they want they want Rutherglen to improve, but they've got their own businesses to, to run. Rutherglen needs, a, needs the support of Council's Tourism Unit, 
talking to them recently uh, at the RWE and um, uh, the tourism support officer, Alexander, and I asked them how often they see people from, from Inigo Shire Tourism Unit, and she described it as a rarity. Tourism Northeast, a rarity. So they're, they're left to themselves. After they pay for the VIC and the profit from the VIC, they had about $6,000 for to market. Um, they've got the Tweed Ride, they've, they've got other functions. They're always looking, they're great supporters of, um, of the bicycle event. They want to improve Rutherglen. They're a terrific voice for Rutherglen. It's their only voice they've got. We're happy with change, we need change, and that change needs to be driven from, from the Inigo Shire Tourism Unit. For what ideas, it, it'll be very interesting uh, to see how things change, um, but we're all very happy for change there. There's been big changes to the board. There needs to be more changes, and that's why six is in, requiring the CEO to support Destination Rutherglen not just cut it loose. Okay, uh, seconder was Councillor Trenry. I'll reserve my right, okay. Madam Mayor. Anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Shepherd. Can I just ask a question So, um, of the mover? So what about the fact that um, the report says that there's a lack of connection with the industry, that 83% of business, all businesses in Rutherglen are not members of DR? That's a matter for DR. I'll, I've never been a member of DR and am, am, and am not. But that's why the CEO uh, needs to assess and determine it, its future to sit down and to change the model. I don't like the model, but I don't tell DR what to do. The model needs to change. Um, there's inequities, uh, but that was probably their desire to get more income but it needs to be completely revamped and in the Oshire needs to be the lead source to revamp it. Sure. And in terms of um, marketing, so this discussion is around putting marketing back into um, our tourism sector, uh, sorry, uh, tourism section of the council. Um, are you saying to keep marketing of, of Rutherglen with DR? No, point seven is supports the continuation of destination marketing being the responsibility of Council's Tourism Unit, Tourism Northeast, the winemakers, which during that report it talks about the winemakers being the hook, that wine is the hook. Rutherglen is a lot more than just wine and just wine makers. I know it's very, very important. I don't know whether it's the hook. As well as input from business, from industry and destination mm -hmm. Rutherglen. We need them all to get together and work for a common purpose. You walk into the Visitor Information Centre, which, which Councillor Murdoch says, the volunteers are everywhere. They are happy, they are keen, they're energetic. Uh, I, th I think they do a great job, and the figures speak speak for themselves. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and the wine, the um, so we're going to we were going to wind up the uh, Rutherglen Wine Centre Board. So what what happens with them in your model? The Rutherglen Wine Centre Board, which I'm a member and Councillor Murdoch is, and Councillor Price attends when when she can. That's just the link between council and and Rutherglen. I, there's no councillors live there. Um, Councillor Murdoch and I would, they would probably see us more than the rest of council combined, which is fine. Um, the wine board stays in its current state because the money goes from the Shire, the 147,000 from the Shire to the wine board. We look at the figures. Uh, the council finance committee looks at all of the figures and sees how that money is distributed and to make sure that they don't become insolvent and then destination rather than pay the staff. I'll just check again. So the, um, the Rutherglen Wine Centre Board 
are happy to continue. Like they, they haven't been talking about that they don't, they think they should be out of that space. No, and that's not part of this motion. Uh, just to be clear, it is under number five. Number five has been thrown out. So it's Madam not Man. in there. So the question from Councillor Shepherd was to clarify that you want that board to remain as part because it's no longer out. So is that a fair assumption? The motion just stays the, the way it is. It's one, six and seven. So I'll have a question then just to clarify what does happen to the Rutherglen Wine Centre Board? Well, in the short term, six is requires the CEO to support Destination Rutherglen Inc in assessing and determining its future. I'm sure the wine board will come up as part of that. So, uh, again, clarification, because part of, for me, what's confusing is that it's so confusing. Is the Rutherglen Wine Centre Board part of Destination Rutherglen? No. So why would the continuation of Destination Rutherglen in mean that the Rutherglen Wine Centre Board would be part of that? I don't understand. Can you explain it, please? I realise that you don't understand, and it's uh, some, some say that it's quite complicated. I don't think, think it is. Council's arrangement is the 147000 which it pays to the wine board, which is a section 86. It's, it's an audited committee. The finance committee uh, look at the figures after every meeting. It's accountable to, to council because council uses ratepayers' money. Um, so, therefore, that board should stay. We're not just handing over a blank cheque to DR. Sorry, I, I, I need to ask another question. So, I'm unsure, could you explain what that wine board does with that money? Just to be clear, what does the wine board do with the 147000 Runs the VIC for a start, um, promotes Rutherglen, Glen, uh, runs events, it runs the Tweed Ride and it runs other events. Um, they, have, they have meetings usually at a winery at least once a month and they've got a special name for them where they try and bring the winemakers and business and industry together and I think they do a good job of it. Um, uh, the winemakers that I speak to or have spoken to recently uh, have only got praise for Destination Rather Glen. The winemakers are different to the board of winemakers. They are, and, and at the last wine board meeting, the chair made that very clear that the chair of the winemakers of Rather Glen does not speak on behalf of the winemakers of Rather Glen, he speaks on behalf of that board. Councillor Shepherd, does this further questioning for clarification? Yes. Yes, she can. And then Councillor, hang on, and then Councillor Trini, Trinery. Well, he's the seconder, isn't he? Oh, you reserved oh, your right. I've got a question. Oh, question. Okay, we've all got questions. All right, so Councillor Shepherd's still asked. She can continue to ask the questions and then you will get a turn. Yeah, Councillor Shepherd. For the 83% of people, of the businesses that aren't represented in DR, and quite a few of them were pushing for this reform, um, we were able to say that we can show um, an increase and report on the ratio of overnight st stays in, the, in Rutherglen as a share of Indigo overnight stays, and we could increase and report on the percentage of all sector industry in the Rutherglen SA2, engaging and communicating with council on the business form. So we were able to give, me with this previous um, motion, we were going to push for um, measurable outcomes. So. And those 83% of people that aren't um, on that board, uh, uh, sorry, aren't represented by just DR, are they... Yet. I'm not sure what the question well, is. I haven't got there. How, how, how are Destination Rutherland going to change to be able to do that same thing, show a measurable um, increase in tourism and also represent the 83% of the businesses that aren't represented at the moment? What makes you say that the 83% of people who aren't members of Destination Rather Glen are for the report and against DR? What makes you say that? Sorry, I should clarify that. I don't think the 83% are against, but at the, at the moment they're not being represented 
if they're not on it, if they're not a member. So the question was, am I right? Just to be clear, the, can, the question you're asking, Councillor Gaffney, for clarification is what would be the measurements used that are different to the ones as in you in not, ha not including them in this motion, how will you make those measurements? Okay, Councillor. Well, you would measure them on whether there's an increase in overnight stays and et cetera, just like you said when, when you spoke to the other motion and Councillor Goldsworthy did as well. It was interesting that the public meeting that was called in regard to the Rutherglen Destination Management Structure Review, there were less than 20 turned up. In fact, I think there was just as many staff and councillors there. Of the submissions, and of which there were 71 pages of them, most of them were supporting DR, not against. So to say, I want change, change needs to be there. I'm sure that Councillor Trenary, Councillor Murdoch and Councillor Price want change as well. But will change with the community. Destination Rather Glen is not strictly like a Chamber of Commerce. They represent the community as a whole. They represent Arts Rather Glen. If somebody wants something done, they're a conduit to council. Uh, the CEO has been at some meetings of the wine board and DR, and they raise a lot of community issues. They are, they're more a community organisation than a business organisation, but they realise that tourism in Rather Glen is its lifeblood. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Trenary, I think you were going to ask questions. Councillor Goldsworthy, were you first? I wasn't sure. Yeah. Councillor Goldsworthy was first. Sorry, go. Uh, to you. the mover of the motion, do you believe that for the 286 um, businesses or thereabouts that aren't represented by uh, this structure, that $800 in membership fees uh, would represent good value for them? No, I don't. Do they presently sell alcohol in that combined visitor information centre area? Yes, they do. Uh, given your earlier statement, would you be prepared to uh, add another dot point onto the motion to suggest that they don't sell alcohol out of that facility? No, I don't. So do you not believe what you just said? As in, you, you said we shouldn't be selling alcohol there, but now you, you won't let them. I was talking about point 10, if you like, I'll read it out to you, because this is the motion that you moved, that, that council considers the sale of wine at the Rutherglen Visitor Information Centre during the implementation period. I don't know why you would have put that up unless you were for council being involved in the sale of liquor. Destination Rutherglen sell liquor, the wine board doesn't, and Indigo Shire doesn't at this stage, but if your motion had got up, we would have been. Councillor Trenary. It's interesting how many questions are coming into the debate. But, um, <laughs> well, if for if clarification. If I'm going to, I'd, I will, for clarification, um, Councillor Gaffney, I'd, I was lucky enough to be Mayor four or five years ago, whenever it was. I managed to turn up to all those meetings and people spoke about you and Councillor Murdoch, who was uh, regularly attended those meetings. I dare say you uh, um, have the most experience over there at, at all three levels, um, and now Councillor Price is also getting involved. But in your opinion, um, being the most experienced councillor here, has Indigo Shire done enough to try and help with the marketing over there? Not by a long shot. Thank you. I'd okay. just like to make a comment, Madam Mayor. I'm I'd... used to being the interrogator, not the interrogated, but it's been a good change. Um, yes, Councillor... So just to be clear, councillors, this, these are questions for clarification. Yep. So, yes. So I'm just trying to clarify that last answer. Um, I'm just wondering what, um, what assistance have we given to the uh, Rutherglen community and uh, the businesses over there to try and assist them in um, their marketing and um, uh, trying to promote their businesses? Mr Florence. Um, so... In recent times, probably the second half of last year and ongoing now, um, Council has been responsible for um, the social media campaigns, the uh, website management, the linking of the destination, Rutherglen as a destination to the broader T&E, um, high country region marketing campaigns. Um, 
the evidence of the interactions between the tourism staff and um, and DR has been um, quite consistent and quite strong over recent times. Um, so Council's tourism department has had a very strong presence with uh, with DR, particularly in the marketing uh, component. Um, in recent times, Council has employed a business development officer um, as well as expanded the role of the invest uh, economic and investment coordinator's position, which is spending a lot of time um, walking the beat, if you like, um, visiting all businesses across the Shire and particularly uh, in Rutherglen because of the disparity of, uh, or I should say, the lack of engagement by so many of the businesses in the, in the bodies that are supposedly there to represent them. Certainly. What do you believe the unintended consequences are by only passing motions one, six and seven and leaving out the rest? Uh, my view, uh, my professional view is that um, the purpose of this whole process and the report was focused on um, improving the visitor economy and by any measure the visitor economy in Rutherglen is lagging um, compared with other parts of the Shire and other parts of the state. Um, DR was set up as a tourist um, association. It is funded to run the VIC. It's not funded to be a quasi-community um, coordination, albeit the model has allowed that to happen. Um, I think by having a truncated motion really uh, doesn't change anything and um, doesn't address the fundamental issue of improving the economic output of Rutherglen. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, Councillor Shepherd. I just wanted to check. So since we've taken over the um, digital marketing, is it true that uh, the click clickable through response is improved by 993%? That's correct. Point of order, Madam Mayor, where's the clarification? Sorry? We're trying to clarify the motion and we're asking, we're sitting here asking Dorothy Dick's questions to try and get into the sorry, debate. Sorry, Councillor. What was the, what was the clarification? Councillor, that was a very clear question about increase in What was the clarification is what I'm asking. Were, the, were the increase in clicks since we've been involved increased by 993%? That's a pretty clear question. Where, where is that in the motion? Why are we getting a clarification on that when it's not in the motion? I think we're, well, I'm going to allow these questions, including yours, because they are about actually teasing out what is a very fraught issue here. I think we're trying to balance the need for uh, tourism improvement with uh, a complex structure that has not worked, at the same time knowing that in changing that there are community issues that will be really f seriously affected and we're trying to work out the right way to do both those things. Therefore, all of the questions that I've heard so far have been relevant to that and therefore I've allowed them and that is my call, Councillor. So now I am going to uh, get to the point. I think we need to wind this up and we need to make a decision. Councillor Trenary, you reserved your right. Would you like to speak now? Oh, sorry. Has anyone else not had an opportunity to speak? Oh, okay. Has the okay, mover actually so, spoken to it? Uh, yes, the mover has spoken to it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, who would else would like to speak to the motion? You spoke to the motion. You spoke at length. <laughs> Councillor Gaffney... I'd did... have to check the tape. Yeah. yeah, we'll check the tape. I'm pretty sure, but thank you for your question. Um, who else would like to speak to the motion? Councillor Gaffney, uh, Councillor Goldsworthy. If it helps, I'll <laughs> yeah, turn that that way. Really, big mistake to mix you two up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Councillor Goldsworthy. Look, I, I'm, a, I'm against this um, motion only because it's a partial motion. It, it doesn't um, incorporate what we need it to be. I think um, by letting this structure continue the way it is, we're um, going to do a disservice to the community of Rutherglen and to the business community in particular. Um, nothing will change. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Shepherd. I have sympathy for this uh, motion because 
um, as, I, as I said the, for the previous motion, I, I understand that DR fulfils an important role in that space mm. and getting rid of them seems or not, it doesn't say to get rid of them. It says to determine their future. But, um, you know, and, and, and perhaps determining their future is, is the thing that we wanted to keep in the previous motion, which might put them back in as a, as a tourist association, which works at a local level, that we then have the board, uh, the, that other committee above them that works at the higher level marketing. To me, that would be the best system that keeps D, DR in, in some, some way in as a tourist association that, that deals with all those things like the tourist, Chiltern Tourism Association, association does. Um, so I am, you know, I, I am sympathetic for that they do do an amazing role in there and it's important to have them working in that space. But I also see that we do need that overarching strategic marketing that is coordinated and 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 uh, uh, reflective of all the businesses um, at that higher level. So I'm, um, you know, neither of the motions really speak to what I'm after. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion, Councillor Price? I think that we have to own our place in this. I think that we have been part of this structure, and we have not. Um, We've not stepped back and said, what has this actually developed into over this period of time? If its intention originally was one thing and it's developed into another, then we need to own our place in that. I think that this report has been important to conduct because it's made sure that we had the conversation and I think that we're seeing the benefit of that already by seeing the tourism unit more actively engaged with Rutherglen over the past, uh, over the second half of last year, as um, Mr. Florence said, I think that is probably directly attributable, attributable to the fact that we've conducted this structure review. The next point is about assessing and determining DR's future. I think that that is still a very valid discussion that needs to take place. We need to refocus exactly what they need to do. And part of that needs to be to really hone in on the fact that, as we all are aware due to the report, 83% of businesses are not reflected in Destination Rutherglen. But again, I say we own our place in that. And I think that by um, investing our tourism resources and working with Destination Rutherglen and reassessing and determining what they need to go forward with in the future, that we might be able to um, have a more representative body as DR. And to the third point in the motion, supporting the continuation of destination marketing, being the responsibility of Council's Tourism Unit, Tourism North East, winemakers, input of business and, in, and industry and DR. Well, I think that for me, that says that in place of this high level committee that we were talking about in the previous motion, that these relationships have to exist anyway that our tourism unit is expected to have relationships with um, high-level high tourism businesses and be having high-level economic development conversations um, anyway. I don't think that needs a committee that meets three or four times a year. So, for me, th that re-establishes the position of Destination Rather Glen and I think that there's enough that they're doing there um, that has such important links to community and business that means that we cannot um, get rid of them. And that doesn't mean that we take the foot off the pedal. I think that means that we do really go back to them and say, which they're in agreement with, they want, they want to be a really active part in this um, structure as well. And so I think we go back to them and we say, now we refocus, we've refocuses We've refocused our resources to make sure that they're equally shared in Rutherglen and now we need to refocus Destination Rutherglen and make sure that the things that we set out to achieve in this report, being um, an increase in overnight stays and an increase in um, the tourism that Rutherglen receives as a proportion of the Shire, that they're still measured by this portion of the original recommendation. 
Another question, yes, Councillor. Just before oh, I vote on this, I'm just wondering, it's raised on uh, several times by a number of uh, councillors speaking to the motion about the cost and the inequity. I'm wondering if the CEO could speak to that and explain it uh, fully about those costs that have been provided. Sorry, councillor, I might have to get you to clarify that question. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me to explain. So there's been figures bandied around that the council provides $147,000 to the Rutherglen um, Visitor Information Centre that uh, we provide uh, considerably more to others. I'm just wondering if you could uh, provide a breakdown of what they actually go to and are they representative of the total costs given to an individual centre or do they cover costs for other things like wages for the overview uh, of all visitor information centres in the area, that sort of thing. Um, I might have to can I defer that to Mark if I can. I, I guess I'm not across in the detail the exact spend by component of all the VICs. I think in general terms though we've um, over time um, yeah, resources and budgets have been allocated to different um, VICs over the years um, I guess based on various factors and the visitations to the town and workload and things like that. So. Um, you know, I probably can't comment on the breakdown, the detail, and how that's more efficiently provided. I guess I'm not close enough to Can I just ask, Councillor Goldsworthy, what's the purpose of your question? Because it, to ask for that level of information without any warning is probably uh, an unfair burden on the, on the staff to try and come up with that. I'm seeking some clarity just on the figures that have been spoken to because if they're saying that uh, $324,000 is provided to the Beechworth Visitor Information Centre in difference to 147 to uh, the Rutherglen Wine Centre Board, I'm just looking to say what, why is that difference? You know, like, okay, is so there, why is, the difference? Is, is there a reason behind it? Okay, was, okay, I get, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, Mr Fines, um, you can answer that if you can. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so the visitor services uh, budget includes uh, contributions to the Akandanda site, which is around, and you know, these are round figures of around about um, uh, mid forty thousand. Um, Chilton is around just under thirty thousand, which includes a contribution to the Chilton Tourism District uh, Destination, sorry, Development Inc. for running the VIC. Um, there's 147 that goes to um, the Wine Centre Board, which then is passed on to DR. And the Beechworth 324 um, includes um, the full-time uh, visitor services and industry coordinator, which covers all of those other sites. So it's got uh, a larger wage component in there. And it also houses the... Um, a lot of the uh, initiatives and the programs that are associated with the delivery of um, visitor servicing across a number of those sites. Council Gaffney, do you have a question? The figures that I quoted are just for Beechworth. There's separate amounts for Yakandanda, there's separate amounts for Chilton, and it was only the percentage of the coordinator, the amount of time that, that she spends working in Beechworth is added. Uh, there's an email that you would have received that, that has a complete breakdown of those costs. Okay. All right. Yeah, Councillor Shepherd, and then I am going to wind this up. Councillor Trini, you get to you get to speak as a seconder. Have you got a question, Councillor Shepherd? Yeah. Okay. I'm just um, interested in whether you're um, able to add in. Um, is there any reason why you don't want to work with the business and industry sectors sectors of Rutherland to establish a business forum entity? Is there any reason why you don't want to add that? Section 7 says that council supports a continuation of destination marketing being the responsibility of council's tourism unit, Tourism North East, the winemakers of Rutherglen, Glen, with input from the business and industry sectors and destination Rutherglen. Glen. Yes, I do. I want, I want them to all work together. Okay. I think it's important. And to, to have a, a paid independent person to come from outside the Shire, more than likely, um, to meet three or four times a year, I don't think uh, it is the solution. Okay, There's thank you. That's... The... Yeah. You've answered it. I can sum up later. Okay. Um, 
All right, Councillor Trenary, you reserved your right before. Would you like to speak now? Um, can I just start, Madam Mayor, to say that um, as robust as this is, all councillors want the right thing by Rutherglen. Everyone sitting around this table wants the right thing by Rutherglen. There is different opinions on how we go about that, um, but everyone sitting around this table wants to do the right thing. Um, just to add, add to what's been said, I'm just trying to remember what was being said in this one and the last one, to be quite honest. I, I, some of the things that came out of the questions, I, I, I was surprised um, in regards to this. We were talking about spending $10,000 on a chair of a new organisation to work out what the community wants when it comes to business. The community's decided, it's called DR. Destination Brother Glen's there, didn't cost us $10,000, absolutely fantastic. Thank you, community, saved us some money. Um, the, the amount of money that's been put aside for um, the VIC to be put that to have that put into a marketing plan, time and effort, is going to greatly benefit Rutherglen, and that's what this end result is about. The VIC, the cost of the VIC, although there's debate over the figures and how much it costs. Looking at what we put in, I think we put in 170,000 12 months ago, and for whatever reason we've dropped it down to. 140, I thought it was 140 in the figures, but there's been other figures um, put around. I don't know whether that states that we're actually having a crack. We hear that it's going really well. Our engagement with the organisation is going well. We're getting extra people in there. So it's, it, it's just the next step. It's just the next step from council. Applying that money that we're going to put into, that was readily available to take over the VIC, into a marketing plan, into working with this community. Um, I think it's achievable, and I think everyone wants that to happen. And I think, regardless of how everyone votes, um, yay or nay today, um, there will be a push from councillors to make sure that this is successful. And I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, councillor. Um, councillor Gaffney, do you want to sum up? We're told about figures uh, about visitation and things. I can tell you, Beechworth is not booming. I have never known shops to lay off staff who have been with them for, for 15 and 20 years and having to lay off. Uh, we've heard that uh, some businesses are struggling to pay rates. We've also been told that Beechworth businesses have gone to food share to get some food. Rutherglen certainly needs an injection, but it's not travelling as bad as it seems to be to be made out here. I think all of the towns in North East Victoria are struggling and council should be doing everything we possibly can to support them. To throw out Destination Rutherglen, Glen, I think would be such a blow to community, to the hardworking committee, to the volunteers at the VIC. Um, as I said before, it's the only voice they've got and whether they should be a community voice or not, they are, and I think they've done a great job, and I congratulate them. Okay, so I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour of Councillor Gaffney's motion? Carried. Okay. 12.1, uh, Beechworth to Yakandanda Rail Trail, Bridges Tender. The recommendation is that Council awards contract, I won't go through it, to North East Civil Construction for the design and construction of bridges for the Beechworth to Yakandanda Rail Trail for the lump sum price of $1,167,616.24. Uh, two, authorises the CEO to sign the contract documents and affix the council's common seal. And three, authorises the CEO financial delegation to approve contract variations up to a total of 10% of the signed contract value. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Goldsworthy, do I have a seconder? Councillor Murdoch. Yes, Councillor Goldsworthy. We're building a track. We need bridges to cross over the, bridge, the uh, creeks. So um, without it, it won't be much of a track. That was concise and I appreciate it. Yes, Councillor Murdoch. <laughs> and we need money to build those bridges. So I think this is an important part of this, um, this track. Okay, Councillor Trenary. Can I just take this time to uh, congratulate Anne Allett on getting on with the job? It was um, quite difficult to start off with and all the different regulations and everything that we get bogged down on. I was like trying to run through mud, but um, now we're up and going. I think it's moving ahead quite quickly and the community is really enthusiastic about it. So congratulations to him and his team. Yes, and I would absolutely second that. Um, any other uh, people to speak to the motion? Any councillors? Councillor Gaffney. Some questions. Yes. 
Has the final route for this rail trail been decided? Uh, so, is this relevant to the motion? Yes. Okay. Yep. If you don't know what the route is, how do you I'm, know? Well, I'm going to assume you build bridges where you know the route is. So, that's why I'm asking, is this relevant? Yeah, it's relevant. It is. Okay. Yep. Cancel it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Director <laughs> Ian Ellett. Uh, no. So, the, um, the route through... I guess Magpie Creek or Wurridgee is, is still to be determined. Uh, the rest of the route is uh, is all mapped out and, and determined. So these bridges are for the rest of the route, not the bit that's not determined? Yeah, absolutely Thank correct. So, so these bridges all relate to, <laughs> to where it uh, parts is determined. of the, the route that are certain. Yep. I thought you'd say that. Okay. Thank you. So that's there'll the be no other bridge required, even if the route doesn't change? Mr Ellett. Uh, yeah, look, there, there are further bridges probably required. Um, so that these relate to the to certain bits of the path in sections four, five, and two. So two is the um, Yak to Osmonds Flat section, and four and five relate to between Wurridgee and Yakandanda. What's the route at Magpie Creek? What number is that? Six, I think. So seven, seven is Kibble Lane, and six is between um, Fanning and the bottom of Kibble. So, with the marketing for this rail trail, there was four million set aside, uh, and T and E are looking after that project, and they've already spent a million dollars. With the million dollars for marketing, has any of that money been spent on this rail trail? Uh, I'll hand that over to the yeah, CEO. CEO. So. Um, to be clear, the, the marketing dollars set aside, not by us, by, uh, but by the state government, was not specifically for this rail trial, but it was for the, high, the ride high country strategy. So that marketing dollars has been over a broader area, including this trail, but it's, it's been spent so far on promoting the northeast as a cycling destination in general terms. So it's $4 million set aside for that, basically a million a year of a four-year period, um, of which one year is already... Um, Transpired, and there's been a lot of money spent on, on promoting cycling in the northeast. So it's about not just about not just about promoting this trail, but pr promoting the northeast as a destination for cycling. The 2.2 million dollars for, for private sector activisation has any of that money been spent, and if so, where? Just, I'm just going to stop you there, Councillor. This is actually about some bridges and, and contracts. I'm not quite sure. You're going on into the overall project. Is it relevant to the this well, contract decision? It is because I'm a bit concerned that there might be enough money to complete this okay. project. Okay, okay. So the... Um, through you, Madam Mayor, the, the, the private sector activation is outside of this tender and outside of our component of building this trail, so uh, like, like the marketing dollars, uh, they're not council responsible to spend those, that money. $2.2 million it was, uh, has been retained by the state government through Regional Development Victoria, who, um, who have been charged with the task of um, incentivising or activa activating investment um, in the whole of the North East, not just India, not just to do with this rail trail. So um, I don't know the exact figures, but I know they've spent a, a small component of that to date in developing a process by which they're seeking expressions of interest for all types of businesses to put in um, for seed funding to help build businesses to take advantage of the state's total investment in, um, in rail trails, not just in uh, Indigo, but also throughout Alpine and, and other parts that are all part of the right high country. So. To date, a small component's been spent just setting up the process and seeking expressions of interest. Um, I don't believe money has started flowing yet in terms of deciding which businesses um, have been successful in getting grants to help seed fund uh, further activation down the track. Councillor Trinary. On the actual, if I could just ask a quick question, on the actual construction side of this project, are we running to budget? And is there any concerns? Uh, look, ge generally, yes. The, the budget estimates for the whole project is, is complex. Um, there, there are concerns which we've, we've flagged. We're, we're not, at this stage, predicting any, any over-budget expenditure. So as each stage goes, you know, I think we're tracking 
reasonably well as each you know, key component or contract is put in place. Um, it gives us confidence because there's obviously less to build and, and less that can um, go off track. So this contract, um, as we've alluded to in the report, is, is slightly above estimate. So we'd, we'd estimate about 1.1 million. So it's around 60, 67,000, I think, sort of over the estimate. But in the broader scale of things, we've got contingency. Um, but yeah, look, I think the contingency is certainly tightening up as, as we go forward. Um, the native veg implications are probably the, you know, the biggest um, thing since the, the, the works estimate was revised in about 2016. At that stage, native veg was estimated at about 82,000. So we're still trying to build a you know, whole trail for that same budget. Um, so, th so there's challenges there. So, so what that's done is forced us to, to rethink and replan you know, some parts of it. Contingency is much tighter. But broadly speaking, you know, we, we remain on track, but you know, cautiously saying that you know, we're within budget and, and you know, I'm not prepared to say that we won't run into some you know, tight problems going forward. But, but right now we're, we're tracking OK. OK. Councillor Shepherd. I know this is a little left field, but um, recently um, the Rowdy Flat Group said that they were willing to put $20,000 towards um, and thought they could get more money too to um, build another bridge from the end of Church Street across to join up with all that. I'm just wondering, um, is there the potential to work with that, um, not, in this, not in this budget, but um, a, a, um, aside from this budget, is there a potential to work with the community on that on, uh, Delivering that bridge. Yeah, look, certainly there is. I don't know what the outcome you know, will be, but I think certainly we recognise that that the trail, you know, particularly through Yak, will provide really important linkages, and a, and a bridge over okay. Yak Creek near the bottom of Church Street would be a really good outcome. So if there's a way that we can, you know, help bring that to fruition, um, but you know, if they've provided or, or given some sort of commitment to a contribution that, you know, the balance or shortfall still might need to be found. So I don't know where that will land, but certainly not a good opportunity to work with community. Okay. So, councillors, just to remind you, we are actually dealing with a motion here and it is about awarding a contract uh, for $1.167,616 million. Um, uh, so I am going back to... Oh, anyone else wish to speak to the motion, please, councillors? Stick to the motion. Okay, I'm going to go back to Councillor Goldsworthy for a sum up. Councillor Merrick, did you get to say as a seconder? There were so many questions firing around today, I'm completely forgotten. <laughs> Do you wish to say anything at this point? Okay, so Councillor Goldsworthy, you don't want to... Okay, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Correct. Right, 12.2, the January Capital Works Report... The recommendation is that Council notes the Capital Works report and year-to-date progress of the Capital Works program, notes the nine additional projects set out in this report, which have had funding approved and endorses, endorses amendments to the expenditure of an additional 308140 bucks and income of additional 357596 budgets, and approves the additional expenditure totalling 280000 for the following projects to enable works to progress and be completed within the current financial year. And they are the Chiltern Main Street footpath improvements, 100,000, ceiling of the North Road Chiltern adjacent to the cemetery, 85,000, IT infrastructure upgrade, 65,000, yay, and Rose and Grand Lane Stanley realignment, 30,000. I only say that because we've had so many problems with IT. Uh, and so does Councillor Shepherd. And yeah, okay, yes, Councillor Goldsworthy. Um, Question first for clarification. Yeah, there with uh, recommendation three on there, is that almost um, subjugating the um, mid year budget uh, review? Um, should we be doing that before we um, sign off on the, the third dot point there? Oh, see you. You might like to boost me afterwards. Um, there's, it, it would have been preferable to have done this at the same time as the mid-year review. Um, however, the mid-year review has been pushed back a month. Um, there are a number of projects here which are um, either fully funded um, or uh, were budgeted to occur next year and we saw for various reasons for each one and go into detail if you like, an opportunity to bring forward those into this year. So the funding for them is basically a swap between the years. From a cash, cash flow point of view, 
uh, we can flag that the mid-year review will include some recommendations to push some projects back to next year, or further back to next year. So there'll be ample cash to fund these, but uh, the reason that they're on there this month is that if there's any chance of getting these uh, up and running and completed within this financial year, we need to start those now and uh, not wait until March, which would have put those at risk. So the question is, are you comfortable for those to be started this year? And we're requesting that that funding be made um, in absence of the mid-year review, but we're, we're very comfortable that the funding and the cash flow will adequately cover those without any concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna put the motion again. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Goldsworthy, seconder. Councillor Shepherd. Um, and uh, do you wish to speak to it, Councillor yeah. Goldsworthy? Just uh, briefly, look, I, I am really glad that we have um, a capital works report uh, on its own. We do need to speak mm -hmm. to it. Unfortunately, we've gone really late tonight in comparison to most of the time. So ordinarily, I'd like to spend more time on it, which I won't. Um, if we had things organised better, uh, I would prefer uh, Dot .3 to have been fully canvassed because we don't know what projects won't get up, um, despite the merits of uh, the ones that are in there. So for that reason, uh, I support it, but uh, hopefully uh, for the new, new council next year, it'll be better organised. Fair comment. Um, Councillor Shepherd. Well, I had the same uh, re idea, really, that uh, I was concerned that uh, the mid-year review is something we normally uh, spend a bit of time over, and it's... I mean, those four things you can see are uh, things we have talked about that need to happen. So I'm pleased that they're being done. But again, it's the way that it's sort of ended up in that motion. Um, but um, And it's great to see those nine projects and most of them being funded. Um, so, uh, and again, I thank you very much for having this as a separate item in the agenda. It really um, gives us, t normally would give us time to uh, talk to it. But Yes, we've probably run out of oomph. Okay, any other councillors wish to speak to it? Yes, Councillor I've just Henry. got a question. Um, out of the cash component, how much cash is coming out of the current budget with these new projects? Uh, CEO? So, yeah, Councillor, you're talking about the uh, projects under item three? Um, yes. Yeah, so... I guess it's going to reassure you that the inclusion of these items uh, in this year uh, did not or would, will not result in any other projects having to be pushed back to, to next year. What, what has occurred is that um, there will be some projects for various reasons uh, which won't be possible to be delivered this year, which then provides an opportunity to free up cash for things that perhaps can be brought forward instead of those. So these aren't pushing any out. These are an opportunity to bring some forward that are, that are needed um, and for various reasons have probably become more urgent than they were or more desirable this year than they Madam were. Madam Mayor, I was after previously. a figure. Sorry? Oh. I was after a figure. Is so we know there? the cash What's implications. 280,000? 280, yeah, for those. Is that not the figure you want? So the, that includes all the new projects that are listed down below? Yeah. Approves additional expenditure for the following projects. So that includes all CEOs. So yeah, that include all the cash, the cash component for all the um, all the projects mentioned, the new projects mentioned in this. That that's that was my reading of it. Is that correct, Trevor, CEO? Uh, so I might need some help on that one, um, Ian or or Greg, as we go. I'm, trouble, I'm having troubles clarifying that, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my oh, take sorry, on that yeah, is, yeah. is 280,000 uh, represents um, the expenditure we're asking for in those four projects listed at the bottom. So two of those are, are new. Chilton Main Street is, is a, an ongoing project that, that has grown. Um, and North Road is in some ways an extension to the Cemetery Road project. You can call it a new project. Um, IT is... Um, I suppose it's it's new, but it's it's an expansion of, of what we're doing. So whether they're, they're new or or existing, Rosengren is is a new one. But two hundred eighty thousand is the additional cash this year. That's that's not budget that we're we're seeking. So if I can add to that, sorry, um, dot point two, we we're referring to an, a nine additional projects. They are projects that have uh, since the budget mostly have been um, we've received new funding, and so there's 
income offsetting the expenditure on those nine additional projects. In addition to those, there's these other four which we're proposed to bring forward from next year. Is that, is that okay, Councillor? As yeah. in, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay, you. thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this? Yes, Council, Council Murdoch. Uh, just a little question. Is, is the Chiltern Main Street Rutherglen? Is that meant to be that or is there another reading to that? Uh, where are you looking, Councillor? Oh, I'm just looking at that, sorry, at the recommendation here. Oh, is that a typo? Oh, okay. So we'll fix that. Thank you. The recommendation's correct, though, that the children must... You, you're voting on that, not the report, so... But we'll make sure that gets corrected. Anyone I, else? I was just going to add a little bit there. It, sure. It's also the North Road Chiltern bit, which is um, right next to the cemetery. It is very disturbing for people to have to s go through dust of people driving past and into put flowers on graves and things like that. It's, it's um, you know, I've personally noted it, but I've, I've also had quite a few other people. So you're pleased this is happening? I'm quite pleased that's Very happening good. because it's not a good look for no. if you're having a funeral to cover people in dust. No, of course, no, absolutely not. Okay, yes, Councillor Trinary. The last one's a question for you. Just make a sure. comment if I could, please. I, I, I too share the concerns about... Um, in essence, being forced into saying yes to this. We like these projects, we want to do them. Um, but we've got to remember we're taking projects out that people will find equally important um, and mm -hmm. things that we've already said we're going to do. Um, so I'm really concerned about the process. I understand they're going ahead, um, but uh, I think we could tidy that up into the future. So I think, um, do you want to comment on that, uh, CEO, about the mid-year review, budget review process being improved is my understanding. Is that that's really what you're alluding to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll we'll, we'll take it on the chin that we could have done this better. We we had a report ready to go uh, for this meeting, but we recognised that um, it probably didn't come up to councillors early enough uh, to allow that um, scrutiny and debate and leading up to the council meeting, which often happens. Obviously, no decisions are made outside the meeting, but there's a lot of briefing and going through the numbers. Um, and we recognised um, at the last briefing before we put the agenda out that not, a, not enough of that had happened. So we made a decision that, no, we should have that further discussion, debate, and allow that to happen with the mid-year review. We could have done better with that. Certainly, we'll learn from it, and we'll take that um, kick in the pants rightly deserved. Um, the, I guess item three, we're still saying... Um, all, all that information which we'd already provided in the background, which didn't make it here, showed that these projects could be funded and delivered this year, these, these projects, um, and they're not, again, in, the inclusion of these uh, hasn't resulted in the deferral of any other project. But there are okay. projects that have That's to be deferred time. for other reasons. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak to this motion? I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you. 13.1, advisory committee minutes. The recommendation is that council receives the attached unconfirmed advisory committee minutes and endorses the officer comments. Does anyone want to move that? Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Anyone want to second? Councillor Price. Anyone wish to speak to this? I'm sorry, but I do. Oh, really? Mm. Okay, go ahead. I know. Most in time. I know you'd prefer we just move quickly on, and so I'll just be very quick all. that the IEAC... Um, the Environment Committee met in December and one of the things that we discussed and we've been discussing for a while is the Dark Skies um, report that we, is eventually going to come to Council talking about, about keeping how we can keep our skies darker for biodiversity and for tourism. So um, it was an interesting report and I think they'll be bringing some sort of presentation to Council. Uh, quite a few other great things in there but I'll leave it. Feel free to go ahead. You've had enough. Okay. Um, Councillor Price. All right. Anyone else wish to speak to this motion? I can't see you if you do. I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. 13.2, uh, the Ambulance Victoria Performance. The recommendation is that the Ambulance Victoria Performance Report for quarter 2, 2019-20 be noted. Do I have someone to move that? Councillor Price. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Murdoch. Yes, Councillor Price. Um, I've asked that this be included on the agenda each time uh, the performance report is provided 
um, which is quarterly. Um, the first thing that I'd like to say is that we appreciate the volunteer the volunteers that we have within the Shire that act on Ambulance Victoria's behalf as, as first responders. We really um, we really value you and I think that's the first thing that we have to say every time that we um, speak about this issue. Um, but the next thing to say is that this will stay an issue on, on this council's radar until we see significant improvement in the response times. And um, I, I'm not at all pleased with the latest figures that have come out that have in fact showed um, a worsening in those response times. So we'll continue to keep this on the agenda for Indigo Shire Council and um, continue to advocate to Ambulance Victoria and to um, the state member, state members. Council Murdoch. Anyone else? Yes, Council Goldsworthy. I just note in the uh, latest online version of the Border Mail, um, it's come out in the last hour or so, they uh, quote Councillor Price again in relation to original comments and there's a, another PR piece from Ambulance Victoria trying to negate uh, our efforts to try and get them or hold them to account. Thank you for that. Um, anyone else wish to speak to the motion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. And I will just note that uh, today the CEO and I requested a meeting with Minister Makakos um, uh, to follow up from the meeting that previously uh, Councillor Gaffney as Mayor um, had last year regarding exactly the same issue, which is that we have the worst response times in Victoria for ambulance uh, in Indigo Shire. It's deteriorated again um, and uh, we are saying that this is just absolutely unacceptable following on from the work that um, Councillor Gaffney did. This is an ongoing issue for Indigo Shire and we're not prepared to let it go. Um, item 13.3, the Council Action Plan. The Council notes the quarter, the second quarter 2019-20 Council Plan Progress Report. Do I have someone to move that? Yes, a question from Councillor. Once Goldberg. again, we're getting late in the night, so I'll keep it brief. I just note that Appreciate at, it. Um, page three on the large spreadsheet, item 2.2.1, uh, um, review of the current asset management plans. It just says in the update, uh, progress delayed, expected completion by March 2020. Um, so I gather it's delayed, delayed, is it? Because I don't think it's going to come to us next month according to our schedule. Look, it, it, it probably has been delayed, delayed. I, I think that's one of, of definition. Um, the March completion is probably an internal thing that's got to come through a process. I, I think for this audience, that would have been more accurate to say uh, June, we're, we're still very focused on completing those council plan actions this year. Um, so, look, I think there's just probably an internal versus a, a completion through council definition that's missed the mark a little bit. Thank you. And, and just the uh, last one on uh, 5.3.1, which is on page 8. Um, it talks about a conductor review of all council services to recommend opportunities for efficiencies. Our program commenced six weeks, uh, sorry, six services scheduled uh, for 1920. Just wondering, will we get to view those? Will we get to, will we get to view the uh, service reviews that are going to be done? Um, service reviews, um, we've certainly got a, a program up and running. There will be a mix of um, different types of service reviews. Some of them are going to be um, in very internally focused um, within departments that are, um, I guess, back, back of office type, type um, reviews and we'll certainly keep council laws informed of progress and successes in those, in those reviews. There'll be some reviews that are very externally focused, so before um, you know, some of them require um, you know, the, the sort of services that are provided to the community, direct coalface type stuff, and some of those service reviews may well um, involve questionnaires and discussions with the community about what the sort types of services they want to see and so on, and so there'll be sort of counselling involvement in those types of reviews very early in the process as we go to talk, talk to the community. So there'll be sort of a mixed bag in terms of councillor involvement in those. But certainly you'll be kept in form of um, progress of service reviews and successes of them and outcomes of them as we go through. 
I would be keen to see those service reviews uh, in their entirety for all of them because all of them have budget implications and we need to know that we're offering the right services at the right time. They're not just doing something because we've always done it that way. So your comments are noted. Anyone else uh, wish to speak to Council Action Plan? Moved by Councillor Goldsworthy, seconded. Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Anyone else wish to speak to it? I'd like to speak to it. Oh, please go ahead. Yep. If it's not in the Council Action Plan, uh, it probably shouldn't get done. If it's not there, it shouldn't get budgeted. So it's a really important document. Of and I'm, I'm glad we're reporting on it. And uh, it is, once again, if we had more time and um, <laughs> if it wasn't so late in the night, we, we probably should go through it and give it the due uh, diligence it deserves. So, Councillor, even though it is a late night, is there anything that you wish to raise? <laughs> All right. Uh, except I am going to raise, just very quickly, the fact that the Stanley Township rezoning is still a really critical issue and it is there and it is highlighted and uh, we haven't forgotten. I just think it's important to let Stanley know that. Um, okay, anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Sorry? The lobby bed. The <laughs> Okay, lucky them. Um, uh, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Yeah, yeah Councillor yeah, Shepherd seconded it. Did you wish to speak a second to Councillor? <laughs> I don't think I even oh, asked you. No, no. <laughs> no. Just for those of you watching, we've been going since 2 o'clock, so it's a long meeting. 13.4, um, Advocacy Plan Update 2019-20. Uh, the recommendation is that Council notes the updated Advocacy Plan. Do I have someone to move that? Thank you, Councillor Goldsworthy. And second to Councillor Price. Go well, ahead. Well, one, once again, it's an extremely important document, yep. uh, particularly to the community. Uh, what we're just talking about, Ambulance Victoria, we need yep. to advocate on behalf of our community. Um, we need to know the plan behind it, and that's why we have this document. We need to plan for it. And we need to advocate to the right levels of the government. So uh, I recommend it to um, the council that we pass it and keep uh, abreast of what's going on with it. Yep. Thank you. Council Price. Well, I did have one question. Sorry. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, yeah. The native veg offsets. I was just wondering if we could get a, an update on where we're up to. Sorry, with where that. are you talking about there? In That's in the um, third one. Government reform. Okay. Okay, so you, you're, you're asking for an update? If there's any update. Do you want it now or do you want to take it on notice? Um, if it can't be quick now, then, yeah, I'd like... Mm -hmm. I'm happy to receive an email. I'm happy to receive a dot point answer now, but happy to receive an email also. Um, just really quick, I'm not sure how it sort of sits in the advocacy plan. I need to go back and read that, but certainly in relation three. to um, the, the rail Sorry. trail. So we have seen some reform in the way they're Sorry. assessing and evaluating uh, native edge offsets for linear trails. So they're happy to look at the impact of the trail as a whole rather than you know, stop and pause at every single tree. So I think we've seen some real benefit in um, you know, one of, the, one of the sections that we've just had uh, approved or, or quantified, and that's between uh, Wiradjuri and the roundabout. Now, you know, as I said before, it's still well above probably what we'd hope to pay for native veg offsets, but it's, it's coming back the right way. So we have seen some reform. Yes, Councillor Shepherd. Sorry, uh, just the waste management. Um, I note that there's been a purple bin, is it purple, yep. come out? And there's been a lot of discussion on our Facebook pages around why doesn't Indigo Shire have one? We're not one of the ones listed on the purple bin list. I was just wondering, with, do you have, is it too early to update us on that? That's, that's there under the waste management funding support to meet the ongoing challenges of waste and resource recovery and provision of services. So, councillors, I guess the, the information coming out is very fresh and very sketchy. Um, it was announced yesterday. Um, that the state was putting money in for this. Um, we need to really wait for more detail. It talks about a rolling implementation over the next 10 years. So I'm presuming that um, people with existing contracts with co need to work through those contracts. And I'm, I suspect that the rollover contracts, sorry, the replacement contracts, would then be looking at the, um, the tendering for four bins instead of three, which we currently have. So I'm presuming ours, which is probably, at a guess, probably got five or six years that's still left to run on ours, I would have thought. Um, uh, is still contracted, so we, unless there's a variation to that, but there's a lot more detail still to come on how the government expects to roll this out. There's also the 
container deposit scheme as well, rolled into that as well, which we still need to get a lot more information on, but very early days. Must be. Okay, anyone else wish to speak to the advocacy plan update? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Carried. No notices of motion, unless you've got a surprise for me, Council. Uh, item 15.1 is the Mayor's Diary. I'm, I propose to go through that in detail, line by line, but I won't. 16.1 <laughs> is the decisions registered. That's for information. Um, again, for people to have a look at the decisions we've made and where we're up to with those, just so people can check back and see what's going on, and there's quite a number of them now. General business. Yes, Councillor Gaffney. Just one for the CEO and uh, perhaps with HR, and that's to ask whether Inigo Shire Council has a program regarding the employment of people with a disability. Just for notation at this stage, and perhaps you could... I don't want a report, just a verbal or do, whatever. Yeah, next, time. next time. Okay, so would you like that for a briefing, Councillor? Definitely not tonight. No, no, Councillor. Do, uh, um, do you want to schedule yeah, it for a yeah, briefing sure, around how we sure. work, yeah. make sure that we are inclusive of people with disability yeah. in our workplace? Yeah. A previous okay. employer of mine used to have a policy. Okay. I don't want a policy, but I'd be interested. All right, so we'll make note of that for a briefing. Thanks. Okay, Councillors, any other general business? I saw that. Uh, I'm going to take that as a no. So I'm going to call the meeting to a close. Thank you all. The next meeting, Tuesday the 31st of March at 6.30.